Chapter Zero of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Sela. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Introduction. This anthology of American humor represents a process of selection that has been going on for more than fifteen years, and in giving it to the public it is perhaps well that the editor should proceed it with a few words of explanation as to its meaning and scope. Not only all that is fairly representative of the work of our American humorists, from Washington Irving to Mr. Dooley, has been gathered together, but also much that is merely fugitive and anecdotal. Thus, in many instances, literary finish has been ignored in order that certain characteristic and purely American bits should have their place. The editor is not unmindful of the danger of this plan, for where there is such a countless number of witticisms, so-called, as are constantly coming to the surface, and where so many of them are worthless, it must always take a rare discrimination to detect the genuine from the false. This difficulty is greatly increased by the difference of opinion that exists, even among the elect, with regard to the merit of particular jokes. To paraphrase an old adage, what is one man's laughter may be another man's dirge. The editor desires to make it plain, however, that the responsibility in this particular instance is entirely his own. He has made his selections without consulting anyone, knowing that if a consultation of experts should attempt to decide about the contents of a volume of American humor, no volume would ever be published. The reader will doubtless recognize in this anthology many old friends. He may also be conscious of admissions. These admissions are due either to the restrictions of publishers or the impossibility of obtaining original copies or the limited space. End of introduction. Recording by Joe Sela. Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Sela. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Walter Van Twiller by Washington Irving. It was in the year of our Lord, 1629, that Minheer Walter Van Twiller was appointed governor of the province of New Netherlands under the commission and control of their high mightinesses the lord states general of the united netherlands and the privileged west india company this renowned old gentleman arrived at new amsterdam in the merry month of june the sweetest month in all the year when don apollo seems to dance up the transparent firmament when the robin the thrush and a thousand other wanton songsters make the woods to resound with amorous ditties and the luxurious little bob lincoln reveals among the clover blossoms of the meadows all which happy coincidences persuaded the old dames of New Amsterdam, who were skilled in the art of foretelling events, that this was to be a happy and prosperous administration. The renowned Wouter, or Walter, Van Twiller, was descended from a long line of Dutch burgomasters, who had successfully dozed away their lives and gone fat upon the bench of magistracy in Rotterdam, and who had comported themselves with such singular wisdom and propriety that they were never either heard or talked of which, next to being universally applauded, should be the object of ambition of all magistrates and rulers. There are two opposite ways by which some men make a figure in the world, one by talking faster than they think, and the other by holding their tongues and not thinking at all. By the first, many a smatterer acquires a reputation of a man of quick parts. By the other, many a dunderpate, like the owl, the stupidest of birds, comes to be considered the very type of wisdom. This, by the way, is a casual remark which I would not, for the universe, have it thought I apply to Governor Van Twiller. It is true he was a man shut up within himself, like an oyster, and rarely spoke, except for in monosyllables, but then it was allowed he seldom said a foolish thing. So invincible was his gravity that he was never known to laugh or even to smile through the whole course of a long and prosperous life. Nay, if a joke were uttered in his presence that set light-minded hearers in a roar, it was observed to throw him into a state of perplexity. Sometimes he would deign to inquire into the matter, and when after much explanation the joke was made as plain as a pike staff, he would continue to smoke his pipe in silence, and at length, knocking out the ashes, would exclaim, Well, I see nothing in all that to laugh about. With all his reflective habits, he never made up his mind on a subject. 
His adherents accounted for this by the astonishing magnitude of his ideas. He conceived every subject on so grand a scale that he had not room in his head to turn it over and examine both sides of it. Certain it is that if any matter were propounded to him on which ordinary mortals would rashly determine at first glance, he would put on a vague, mysterious look, shake his capacious head, smoke some time in profound silence, and at length observe that he had his doubts about the matter, which gained him the reputation of a man slow of belief and not easily imposed upon. What is more, it gained him a lasting name, for to this habit of the mind has been attributed his surname Twiller, which is said to be a corruption of the original Twidgefler, or in plain English, Doubter. The person of this illustrious old gentleman was formed and proportioned as though it had been molded by the hands of some cunning Dutch statuary, as a model of majesty and lordly grandeur. He was exactly five feet six inches in height, and six feet five inches in circumference. His head was a perfect sphere, and of such stupendous dimensions, that Dame Nature, with all her sex's ingenuity, would have been puzzled to construct a neck capable of supporting it. Wherefore, she wisely declined the attempt and settled it firmly on top of his backbone, just between the shoulders. His body was oblong and particularly capacious at bottom, which was wisely ordered by Providence, seeing that he was a man of sedentary habits and very adverse to the idle labor of walking. His legs were short but sturdy in proportion to the weight they had to sustain, so that when erect he had not a little the appearance of a beer barrel on skids. His face, that infallible index of the mind, presented a vast expanse unfurrowed by those lines and angles which defigure the human countenance with what is termed expression. Two small gray eyes twinkled feebly in the midst, like two stars of lesser magnitude in a hazy firmament, and his full-fed cheeks, which seemed to have taken toll of everything that went into his mouth, were curiously mottled and streaked with dusky red, like a Spitzenberg apple. His habits were as regular as his person. He daily took his four stated meals, appropriately exactly an hour to each. He smoked and doubted eight hours, and he slept the remaining twelve of the four and twenty. Such was the renowned Walter Van Twillery, a true philosopher, for his mind was either elevated above or tranquilly settled below the cares and perplexities of this world. He had lived in it for years, without feeling the least curiosity to know whether the sun revolved round it or it round the sun and he had watched for at least half a century the smoke curling from his pipe to the ceiling, without once troubling his head with any of those numerous theories by which a philosopher would have perplexed his brain in accounting for its rising above the surrounding atmosphere. In his council he presided with great state and solemnity. He sat in a huge chair of solid oak hewn in the celebrated forest of The Hague, fabricated by an experienced temperament of Amsterdam, and curiously carved about the arms and feet into exact imitations of gigantic eagle claws. Instead of a scepter, he swayed a long Turkish pipe, wrought with jasmine and amber, which had been presented to a stadtholder of Holland at the conclusion of a treaty with one of the petty Barbary powers. In this stately chair would he sit, and this magnificent pipe would he smoke, shaking his right knee with a constant motion, and fixing his eye for hours together upon a little print of Amsterdam, which hung in a black frame against the opposite wall of the council chamber. Nay, it has even been said that when any deliberation of extraordinary length and intricacy was on the carpet, the renowned Walter would shut his eyes for full two hours at a time, that he might not be disturbed by external objects, and at such times the internal commotion of his mind was evinced by certain regular guttural sounds, which his admirers declared were merely the noise of conflict made by his contending doubts and opinions. It is with infinite difficulty I have been able to collect these biographical anecdotes of the great man under consideration. The facts respecting him were so scattered and vague, and diverse of them so questionable in point of authenticity, that I have had to give up the search after many and decline the admission of still more, which would have tended to heighten the coloring of his portrait. I have been the more anxious to delineate fully the person and habits of Walter Van Twiller from the consideration that he was not only the first but also the best governor that ever presided over this ancient and respectable province, and so tranquil and benevolent was his reign that I do not find throughout the whole of it a single instance of any offender being brought to punishment, a most indubitable sign of a merciful governor, and a case unparalleled excepting in the reign of the illustrious King Log, from whom it is hinted the renowned Van Twiller was a lineal descendant. 
The very outset of the career of this excellent magistrate was distinguished by an example of legal acumen that gave flattering presage of a wise and equitable administration. The morning after he had been installed in office, and at the moment that he was making his breakfast from a prodigious earthen dish filled with milk and Indian pudding, he was interrupted by the appearance of Wandel Schoonhoven, a very important old burgher of New Amsterdam, who complained bitterly of one Berent Bleeker, inasmuch as he refused to come to a settlement of accounts, seeing that there was a heavy balance in favor of said Wandel. Governor Van Twiller, as I have already observed, was a man of few words. He was likewise a mortal enemy to multiplying writings, or being disturbed at his breakfast. Having listened attentively to the statement of Wandel Schoonhoven, giving an occasional grunt as he shoveled a spoonful of Indian pudding into his mouth, either as a sign that he relished the dish or comprehended the story, he called unto him his constable, and pulling out his breeches pocket a huge jackknife, dispatched it after the defendant as a summons, accompanied by a tobacco box as a warrant. This summary process was as effectual in those simple days as was the seal ring of the great Horon al Rashid among the true believers. The two parties being confronted before him each produced a book of accounts, written in a language and character that would have puzzled any but a high Dutch commentator or a learned decipherer of Egyptian obelisks. The sage Walter took them one after the other and having poised them in his hands and attentively counted over the number of leaves, fell straight away into a very great doubt, and smoked for half an hour without saying a word. At length, laying his finger beside his nose and shutting his eyes for a moment, with the air of a man who has just caught a subtle idea by the tail, he slowly took his pipe from his mouth, puffed forth a column of tobacco smoke, and with marvelous gravity and solemnity pronounced that having carefully counted over the leaves and weighed the books, it was found that one was just as thick and heavy as the other. Therefore, it was a final opinion of the court that the accounts were equally balanced. Therefore, Wandel should give Berent a receipt, and Berent should give Wandel a receipt, and the constable should pay the costs. This decision being straightway made known diffused general joy throughout New Amsterdam, for the people immediately perceived that they had a very wise and equitable magistrate to rule over them. But its happiest effect was that not another lawsuit took place throughout the whole of his administration, and the office of constable fell into such decay that there was not one of those local scouts known in the province for many years. I am the more particular in dwelling on this transaction, not only because I deem it one of the most sage and righteous judgments on record, and well worthy the attention of modern magistrates, but because it was a miraculous event in the history of the renowned Wouter, being the only time he was ever known to come to a decision in the whole course of his life. End of Walter Van Twiller Recording by Joe Sela. Chapter 2 of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean Ed Vaughan. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Wilhelm S. Kieft by Washington Irving. As some sleek ox, sunk in the rich repose of a clover field, dozing and chewing the cud, will bear repeated blows before it raises itself, so the province of New Netherlands, having waxed fat under the drowsy reign of the doubter, needed cuffs and kicks to rouse it into action. The reader will now witness the manner in which a peaceful community advances toward a state of war, which is apt to be like the approach of a horse through a drum, with much prancing and little progress, and too often with the wrong end foremost. Wilhelmus Kieft, who in 1634 ascended the gubernatorial chair, to borrow a favourite, though clumsy, appellation of modern phraseologists, was of a lofty descent, his father being inspector of windmills in the ancient town of Sardam, and our hero, we are told, when a boy, made very curious investigations into the nature and operation of these machines, which was one reason why he afterward came to be so ingenious a governor. His name, according to the most authentic etymologists, was a corruption of Kiva, that is to say, a wrangler or scolder, and expressed the characteristic of his family, which, for nearly two centuries, have kept the windy town of Sardom in hot water and produced more tartars and brimstones than any ten families in the place, and so truly did he inherit this family peculiarity, that he had not been a year in the government of the province before he was universally denominated William the Testy. 
his appearance answered to his name he was a brisk wiry waspish little old gentleman such a one as may now and then be seen stumping about our city in a broad-skirted coat with huge buttons a cocked hat stuck on the back of his head and a cane as high as his chin his face was broad but his features were sharp his cheeks were scorched into a dusky red by two fiery little grey eyes his nose turned up and the corners of his mouth turned down pretty much like the muzzle of an irritable pug dog i have heard it observed by a profound adept in human physiology that if a woman waxes fat with the progress of years her tenure of life is somewhat precarious but if happily she withers as she grows old she lives forever such promised to be the case with william the testy who grew tough in proportion as he dried he had withered in fact not through the process of years but through the tropical fervour of his soul which burns like a vehement rushlight in his bosom inciting him to incessant broils and bickerings ancient tradition speaks much of his learning and of the gallant inroads he had made into the dead languages in which he had made captive a host of greek nouns and latin verbs and brought off rich booty in ancient saws and apothems which he was wont to parade in his public harangues as a triumphant general of yore his spolia optima of metaphysics he knew enough to confound all hearers and himself into the bargain in logic he knew the whole family of syllogisms and dilemmas and was so proud of his skill that he never suffered even a self-evident fact to pass unargued it was observed however that he seldom got into an argument without getting into a perplexity and then into a passion with his adversary for not being convinced gratis he had moreover skirmished smartly on the frontiers of several of the sciences was fond of experimental philosophy and prided himself upon inventions of all kinds his abode which he had fixed at a bowery or country seat at a short distance from the city just at what is now called dutch street soon abounded with proofs of his ingenuity patent smoke-jacks that required a horse to work them dutch ovens that roasted meat without fire carts that went before the horses weathercocks that turned against the wind and other wrong-headed contrivances that astonished and confounded all beholders the house too was beset with paralytic cats and dogs the subjects of his experimental philosophy and the yelling and yelping of the latter unhappy victims of science while aiding in the pursuit of knowledge soon gained for the place the name of dog's misery by which it continues to be known even at the present day it is in knowledge as in swimming he who flounders and splashes on the surface makes more noise and attracts more attention than the pearl diver who quietly dives in quests of treasure to the bottom the vast acquirements of the new governor were the theme of marvel among the simple burghers of new amsterdam he figured about the place as learned a man as a bond at pekin who had mastered one half of the chinese alphabet and was unanimously pronounced a universal genius thus ends the authenticated chronicles of the reign of william the testy for henceforth in the troubles perplexities and confusion of the times he seems to have been totally overlooked and to have slipped forever through the fingers of scrupulous history it is true that certain of the early provincial poets of whom there were great numbers in the new netherlands taking advantage of his mysterious exit have fabled that like romulus he was translated to the skies and forms a very fiery little star somewhere on the left core of the crab while others equally fanciful declared that he had experienced a fate similar to that of the good king arthur who we are assured by ancient bards was carried away to the delicious abodes of fairyland where he still exists in pristine worth and vigour and will one day or another return to restore the gallantry the honour and the immaculate probity which prevailed in the glorious days of the round table all these however are but pleasing fantasies the cobweb visions of these dreaming varlets the poets to which i would not have my judicious readers attach any credibility neither am i disposed to credit an ancient and rather apocryphal historian who asserts that the ingenious wilhelmus was annihilated by the blowing down of one of his windmills nor a writer of latter times who affirms that he fell a victim to an experiment in natural history having the misfortune to break his neck from a garret window of the stadthouse in attempting to catch swallows by sprinkling salt upon their tails still less do i put my faith in the tradition that he perished at sea in conveying home to holland a treasure of golden ore discovered somewhere among the haunted regions of the catskill mountains the most probable account declares that what with the constant troubles on his frontiers the incessant schemings and projects going on in his own perigranium the memorials petitions remonstrances and sage pieces of advice of respectable meetings of the sovereign people 
and the refractory disposition of his counsellors, who were sure to differ from him on every point, and uniformly to be in the wrong. His mind was kept in a furnace heat until he became as completely burnt out as a Dutch family pipe which has passed through three generations of hard smokers. In this manner did he undergo a kind of animal combustion, consuming away like a farthing rushlight, so that when grim death finally snuffed him out, there was scarce left enough of him to bury. End of Wilhelmus Kieft of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua M. C. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Peter Stuyvesant, by Washington Irving. Peter Stuyvesant was the last, and like the renowned Wouter von Twyler, the best of our ancient Dutch governors. Wouter, having surpassed all who preceded him, and Peter, or Piet, as he was socially called by the old Dutch burghers, who were ever prone to familiarize names, having never been equaled by any successor. He was, in fact, the very man fitted by nature to retrieve the desperate fortunes of her beloved province, had not the fates, those most potent and unrelenting of all ancient spinsters, destined them to inextricable confusion. To say merely that he was a hero would be doing him great injustice. He was in truth a combination of heroes, for he was of a sturdy, raw-boned make, like Ajax Telamon, with a pair of round shoulders that Hercules would have given his hide for, meaning his lion's hide, when he undertook to ease old Atlas of his load. He was, moreover, as Plutarch describes Coriolanus, not only terrible for the force of his arm, but likewise of his voice, which sounded as though it came out of a barrel, and like the selfsame warrior, he possessed a sovereign contempt for the sovereign people, and an iron aspect which was enough of itself to make the very bowels of his adversaries quake with terror and dismay. All this martial excellency of appearance was inexpressibly heightened by an accidental advantage, with which I am surprised that neither Homer nor Virgil have graced any of their heroes. This was nothing less than a wooden leg, which was the only prize he had gained in bravely fighting the battles of his country, but of which he was so proud that he was often heard to declare he valued it more than all his other limbs put together. Indeed, so highly did he esteem it, that he had it gallantly enchased and relieved with silver devices, which caused it to be related in divers histories and legends that he wore a silver leg. End of Peter Stuyvesant. Recording by Joshua M. C. Four of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua M. C. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Anthony von Corlier by Washington Irving. The very first movements of the great Peter on taking the reins of government displayed his magnanimity, though they occasioned not a little marvel and uneasiness among the people of the Manhattoes. Finding himself constantly interrupted by the opposition and annoyed by the advice of his privy council, the members of which had acquired the unreasonable habit of thinking and speaking for themselves during the preceding reign, he had determined at once to put a stop to such grievous abominations. Scarcely, therefore, had he entered upon his authority than he turned out of office all the meddlesome spirits of the factious cabinet of William the Testy, in place of whom he chose unto himself counsellors from those fat, 
somniferous respectable burghers who had flourished and slumbered under the easy reign of walter the doubter all these he caused to be furnished with abundance of fair long pipes and to be regaled with frequent corporation dinners admonishing them to smoke and eat and sleep for the good of the nation while he took the burden of the government upon his own shoulders an arrangement to which they all gave hearty acquiescence nor did he stop here but made a hideous root among the inventions and expedients of his learned predecessor rooting up his patent gallows where caitiff vagabonds were suspended by the waistband demolishing his flagstaffs and windmills which like the mighty giants guarded the ramparts of new amsterdam pitching to the duvel whole batteries of quaker guns and in a word turning topsy-turvy the whole philosophic economic and windmill system of the immortal sage of sardom the honest folks of new amsterdam began to quake now for the fate of their matchless champion antony the trumpeter who had acquired prodigious favor in the eyes of the women by means of his whiskers and trumpet him did peter the headstrong cause to be brought into his presence and eyeing him for a moment from head to foot with a countenance that would have appalled anything else than a sounder of brass prithee who and what art thou said he sire replied the other in no wise dismayed for my name it is antony von corlier for my parentage i am the son of my mother for my profession i am champion and garrison of this great city of new amsterdam i doubt me very much said peter stuyvesant that thou art some scurvy costard monger knave how didst thou acquire this paramount honor and dignity marry sir replied the other like many a great man before me simply by sounding my own trumpet ay is it so quoth the governor why then let us have a relish of thy art whereupon the good antony put his instrument to his lips and sounded a charge with such a tremendous outset such a delectable quaver and such a triumphant cadence that it was enough to make one's heart leap out of one's mouth only to be within a mile of it like as a war-worn charger grazing in peaceful plains starts at a strain of martial music pricks up his ears and snorts and paws and kindles at the noise so did the heroic peter joy to hear the clangor of the trumpet for of him tr might truly be said what was recorded of the renowned st george of england there was nothing in all the world that more rejoiced his heart than to hear the pleasant sound of war and see the soldiers brandish forth their steeled weapons casting his eye more kindly therefore upon the sturdy van corlier and finding him to be a jovial varlet shrewd in his discourse yet of great discretion and immeasurable wind he straightway conceived a vast kindness for him and discharging him from the troublesome duty of garrisoning defending and alarming the city ever after retained him about his person as his chief favorite confidential envoy and trusty squire instead of disturbing the city with disastrous notes he was instructed to play so as to delight the governor while at the repasts as did the minstrels of yore in the days of the glorious chivalry and on all public occasions to rejoice the ears of the people with warlike melody thereby keeping alive a noble and martial spirit end of chapter four recording by joshua m c five of little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Sela. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. General Van Poffenburg. It is tropically observed by honest old Socrates that heaven infuses into some men at their birth a portion of intellectual gold, into others of intellectual silver, while others are intellectually furnished with iron and brass. Of the last class was General Van Poffenburg and it would seem as if Dame Nature, who will sometimes be partial, had given him brass enough for a dozen ordinary braziers. All this he contrived to pass upon William the Testy for genuine gold, and the little governor would sit for hours and listen to his gunpowder stories of exploits, which left those of Tarante the White, 
Don Belianis of Greece, or St. George and the Dragon quite in the background. Having been promoted by William Keefe to the command of his whole disposable forces, he gave importance to his station by the grand eloquence of his bulletins, always styling himself Commander-in-Chief of the Armies of the New Netherlands, though in sober truth these armies were nothing more than a handful of hen-stealing, bottle-bruising ragamuffins. In person he was not very tall, but exceedingly round. Neither did his bulk proceed from his being fat, but Windy, being blown up by a prodigious conviction of his own importance, until he resembled one of those bags of wind given by Elios in an incredible fit of generosity to that vagabond warrior Ulysses. His windy endowments had long excited the admiration of Antony van Corlier, who is said to have hinted more than once to William the Testy that in making Van Poffenburg a general he had spoiled an admirable trumpeteer. As is the practice in ancient story to give the reader a description of the arms and equipments of every noted warrior, I will bestow a word upon the dress of this redoubtable commander. It comported with his character, being so crossed and slashed, and embroidered with lace and tinsel, that he seemed to have as much brass without as nature had stored away within. He was swathed, too, in a crimson sash of the size and texture of a fishing net, doubtless to keep his swelling heart from bursting through his ribs. His face glowed with furnace heat from between a huge pair of well-powdered whiskers, and his valorous soul seemed ready to bounce out of a pair of large, glassy, blinking eyes projecting like those of a lobster. I swear to thee, worthy reader, if history and tradition belie not this warrior, I would give all the money in my pocket to have seen him accoutred cup of pea, booted to the middle, sashed to the chin, collared to the ears, whiskered to the teeth, crowned with an overshadowing cocked hat, and girded with a leathern belt ten inches broad, from which trailed a falchion of a length I dare not mention. Thus equipped he strutted about, as bitter-looking a man of war as the far-famed Moor of Moorhall, when he sallied forth to slay the dragon of Wantley. For what says the ballad? Had you but seen him in this dress, how fierce he looked, and how big, you would have thought him for to be some Egyptian porky pig. He fried it all, cats, dogs, and all, each cow, each horse, and each hog, for fear they did flee, for they took him to be some strange outlandish hedgehog. Knickerbocker's History of New York End of General Van Poffenburg A friend of mine, said a citizen, asked me the other evening to go and call on some friends of his, who had lost the head of the family the day previous. He had been an honest old man, a laborer with a pick and shovel. While we were with the family, an old man entered who had worked by his side for years. Expressing his sorrow at the loss of his friend, and glancing about the room, he observed a large floral anchor. Scrutinizing it closely, he turned to the widow in a low tone asked, Who sent the pick? While Butler was delivering a speech for the Democrats in Boston during an exciting campaign, one of his hearers cried out, How about the spoons, Ben? Benjamin's good eye twinkled merrily as he replied, now don't mention that, please. I was a Republican when I stole those spoons. End of section five. Recording by Joe Sela. Six of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Mason. Maxims by Benjamin Franklin. Never spare the parson's wine, nor the baker's pudding. A house without woman or firelight is like a body without soul or sprite. Kings and bears often worry their keepers. Light purse, heavy heart. He's a fool that makes his doctor his heir. Ne'er take a wife till thou hast a house and a fire to put her in. To lengthen thy life, lessen thy meals. He that drinks fast pays slow. He is ill-clothed who is bare of virtue. Beware of meat twice boiled, and an old foe reconciled. The heart of a fool is in his mouth, 
but the mouth of a wise man is in his heart. He that is rich need not live sparingly, and he that can live sparingly need not be rich. He that waits upon fortune is never sure of a dinner. End of Maxims Of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 Edited by Thomas Lansing Mason Model of a Letter of Recommendation of a Person you are unacquainted with paris april second seventeen seventy seven sir the bearer of this who is going to america presses me to give him a letter of recommendation though i know nothing of him not even his name this may seem extraordinary but i assure you it is not uncommon here sometimes indeed one unknown person brings another equally unknown to recommend him and sometimes they recommend one another as to this gentleman i must refer you to himself for his character and merits with which he is certainly better acquainted than i can possibly be i recommend him however to those civilities which every stranger of whom one knows no harm has a right to and i request you will do him all the favor that on further acquaintance you shall find him to deserve i have the honor to be etc end of model of a letter of recommendation of a person you are unacquainted with little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Mason. Epitaph for Himself The Body of Benjamin Franklin, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out and stripped of its lettering and gilding lies here food for worms yet the work itself shall not be lost for it will as he believed appear once more in a new and more beautiful edition corrected and amended by the author end of epitaph for himself of little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by melanie ward little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one edited by thomas lansing mason why he left uncredited mr dixon a colored barber in a large new england town was shaving one of his customers a respectable citizen one morning when a conversation occurred between them respecting mr dixon's former connection with a colored church in that place i believe you are connected with the church in elm street are you not mr dixon said the customer no nah, sir not at all what are you not a member of the african church not this year sir why did you leave their communion mr dixon if i may be permitted to ask well i tell you sir said mr dixon stropping a concave razor on the palm of his hand it was just like this i joined the church in good faith i gave ten dollars towards the stated gospel the first year and the church people call me brother dixon the second year my business not so good 
and I give only five dollars. That year the people call me Mr. Dixon. This razor hurt you, sir? No, the razor goes tolerably well. Well, sir, the third year I feel very poor. I had sickness in my family. I didn't give nothing for preaching. Well, sir, after that, they call me that nigger Dixon, and I left him. End of Why He Left Recorded by Melanie Ward Ten of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sean Ed Vaughan. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Nothing to Wear by William Allen Butler. Miss Flora and Plimsy of Madison Square has made three separate journeys to Paris, and her father assures me each time she was there that she and her friend Mrs. Harris, not the lady whose name is so famous in history, but plain Mrs. H, without romance or mystery, spent six consecutive weeks without stopping in one continuous round of shopping, shopping alone and shopping together at all hours of the day and in all sorts of weather, for all manner of things that a woman can put on the crown of her head or the sole of her foot, or wrap round her shoulders or fit round her waist, or that can be sewed on or pinned on or laced, or tied on with a string or stitched on with a bow, in front or behind, above or below, for bonnets, mantillas, capes, collars and shawls, dresses for breakfast and dinners and balls, dresses to sit in and stand in and walk in, dresses to dance in and flirt in and talk in, dresses in which to do nothing at all, dresses for winter, spring, summer and fall, all of them different in colour and shape, silk, muslin and lace, velvet, satin and crepe, brocade and broadcloth and other material, quite as expensive and much more ethereal. In short, for all things that could ever be thought of, or milliner, modiste, or tradesman be wrought of. From ten thousand franc robes to twenty sou frills, in all quarters of Paris and to every store, while in Plimsy and Vain stormed, scolded, and swore, they footed the streets, and he footed the bills. The last trip, their goods shipped by the steamer Arago, formed, in Plimsy declares, the bulk of her cargo, not to mention a quantity kept from the rest, sufficient to fill the largest size chest which did not appear on the ship's manifest, but for which the ladies themselves manifested such particular interest that they invested their own proper persons in layers and rows of muslins embroideries worked under clothes, gloves, handkerchiefs, scarfs, and such trifles as those, then wrapped in great shawls like Circassian beauties, gave good-bye to the ship and go-bye to the duties. Her relations at home all marvelled, no doubt. Miss Flora had grown so enormously stout for an actual belle and a possible bride, but the miracle ceased when she turned inside out, and the truth came to light, and the dry goods besides, which, in spite of collector and custom-house sentry, had entered the port without any entry. And yet, though scarce three months have passed since the day this merchandise went on twelve carts up Broadway, this same Miss and Flimsy of Madison Square, the last time we met, was in utter despair, because she had nothing whatever to wear. Nothing to wear? Now, as this is a true ditty, I do not assert, this you know is between us, that she's in a state of absolute nudity, like Powers Greek slave or the Medici Venus, but I do mean to say, I have heard her declare, when at the same moment she had on a dress which cost five hundred dollars and not a cent less, and jewellery worth ten times more, I should guess, that she had not a thing in the wide world to wear. I should mention just here that out of Miss Flora's two hundred and fifty or sixty adorers, I had just been selected as he who should throw all, the rest in the shade, by the gracious bestowal, on myself, after twenty or thirty rejections, of those fossil remains which she called her affections, and that rather decayed but well-known work of art, which Miss Flora persisted in styling her heart. So we were engaged. Our troth had been plighted, not by moonbeam or starbeam, by fountain or grove, but in a front parlour most brilliantly lighted. Beneath the gas fixtures we whispered our love, Without any romance or raptures or sighs, without any tears in Miss Flora's blue eyes, or blushes or transports or such silly actions, it was one of the quietest business transactions, with a very small sprinkling of sentiment, if any, and a very large diamond imported by Tiffany. On her virginal lips, while I printed a kiss, she exclaimed as a sort of parenthesis, 
and by way of putting me quite at my ease you know i'm to poker as much as i please and flirt when i like now stop don't you speak and you must not come here more than twice in the week or talk to me either at party or ball but always be ready to come when i call so don't prove to me about duty and stuff if we don't break this off there will be time enough for that sort of thing but the bargain must be that as long as i choose i am perfectly free for this is a kind of engagement you see which is binding on you but not binding on me well having thus wooed miss flimsy and gained her with the silks crinolines and hoops that contained her i had as i thought a contingent remainder at least in the property and the best rights to rig pure as its escort by day and by night and it being the week of the stuck-ups grand ball their cards had been out a fortnight or so and set all the avenue on the tiptoe i considered it only my duty to call and see if miss flora intended to go i found her as ladies are apt to be found when the time intervening between the first town of the bell and the visitor's entry is shorter than usual i found i won't say i caught her intent on the pier-glass undoubtedly meaning to see if perhaps it didn't need cleaning she turned as i entered why harry you sinner i thought that you went to the flashes to dinner so i did i replied the dinner is swallowed and digested i trust for tis now nine and more so being relieved from that duty i followed inclination which led me you see to your door and now will your ladyship so condescend as just to inform me if you intend your beauty and graces and presence to lend all of which when i own i hope no one will borrow to the stuck-ups whose party you know is to-morrow the fair flora looked up with a pitiful air and answered quite promptly why harry mon cher i would like above all things to go with you there but really and truly i've nothing to wear nothing to wear go just as you are wear the dress you have on and you'll be by far i engage the most bright and particular star on the stuck-up horizon i stopped for her eye notwithstanding this delicate onset of flattery opened on me at once a terrible battery of scorn and amazement she made no reply but gave a slight turn to the end of her nose that pure grecian feature as much as to say how absurd that any sane man should suppose that a lady would go to a ball in the clothes no matter how fine that she wears every day so i ventured again wear your crimson brocade second turn up of nose that's too dark by a shade your blue silk that's too heavy your pink that's too light wear tulle over satin i can't endure white your rose coloured then the best of the batch i haven't a thread of point lace to match your brown more antique yes and look like a quaker the pearl coloured i would but that plaguy dressmaker has had it a week then that exquisite lilac in which you would melt the heart of a shylock here the nose took again the same elevation i wouldn't wear that for the whole of creation why not it's my fancy there's nothing could strike it as more comme il faut. yes but dear me that lean sophronia stuck up has got one just like it and i won't appear dressed like a chit of sixteen then that splendid purple the sweet mazarine that superb point de gouy that imperial green that to feel like tarleton that rich grenadine not one of which is fit to be seen said the lady becoming excited and flushed then where i exclaimed in a tone which quite crushed opposition that gorgeous toilette which you sported in paris last spring at the grand presentation when you quite turned the head of the head of the nation and by all the grand court was so very much courted the end of the nose was portentously tipped up and both the bright eyes shot forth indignation as she burst upon me with the fierce exclamation i have worn it three times at the least calculation and that and most of my dresses are ripped up here i ripped out something perhaps rather rash quite innocent though but to use an expression more striking than classic it settled my hash and proved very soon the last act of our session fiddlesticks is it sir i wonder the ceiling doesn't fall down and crush you you men have no feeling you selfish unnaturally liberal creatures who set yourself up as patterns and preachers your silly pretence why what a mere guess it is pray what do you know of a woman's necessities i have told you and shown you i've nothing to wear and it's perfectly plain you not only don't care but you do not believe me here the nose went still higher i suppose if you dared you would call me a liar our engagement is ended sir yes on the spot you're a brute and a monster and i don't know what i mildly suggested the words hot and tot pickpocket and cannibal tartar and thief as gentle expletives which might give relief but this only proved as a spark to the powder and the storm i had raised came faster and louder it blew and it rained thundered lightning and hailed interjections verbs pronouns till language quite failed to express the abusive and then its arrears were brought up all at once by a torrent of tears and my last faint despairing attempt 
as her observation was lost in a tempest of sobs. Well, I felt for the lady, and felt for my hat too, improvised on the crown of the latter a tattoo. In lieu of expressing the feelings which lay quite too deep for words, as Wordsworth would say, then without going through the form of a bow, found myself in the entry, I hardly know how, on doorstep and sidewalk, past lamppost and square, at home and upstairs in my own easy chair. Poked my feet into slippers, my fire into blaze, and said to myself as I lit my cigar, Supposing a man had the wealth of the Tsar, of the Russians to boot, for the rest of his days, on the whole, do you think he would have much to spare, if he married a woman with nothing to wear? Since that night, taking pains that it should not be bruited abroad in society, I've instituted a course of inquiry, extensive and thorough, on this vital subject, and find to my horror that the fair Flora's case is by no means surprising, but that there exists the greatest distress in our female community solely arising from this unsupplied destitution of dress, whose unfortunate victims are filling the air with the pitiful wail of nothing to wear. Researchers in some of the upper ten districts reveal the most painful and startling statistics, of which let me mention only a few. In one single house on the Fifth Avenue, three young ladies were found all below twenty-two, who have been three whole weeks without anything new in the way of flounced silks, and thus left in the lurch, are unable to go to ball, concert, or church. In another large mansion, near the same place, was found a deplorable, heart-rending case of entire destitution of Brussels Point lace. In a neighbouring block there was found, in three calls, total wants long continued of camel's hair shawls, and a suffering family whose case exhibits the most pressing need of real ermine tippets. One deserving lady, almost unable to survive for the want of a new Russian sable, Still another, whose tortures have been most terrific ever since the sad loss of the steamer Pacific, in which were engulfed, not friend or relation, for whose fate she, perhaps, might have found consolation or borne it at least with serene resignation, but the choicest assortment of French sleeves and collars ever sent out from Paris were thousands of dollars, and all as to style most recherche and rare, the want of which leaves her with nothing to wear and renders her life so drear and dyspeptic that she's quite a recluse and almost a sceptic, for she touchingly says that this sort of grief cannot find in religion the slightest relief, and philosophy has not a maxim to spare for the victims of such overwhelming despair. But the saddest by far of all these sad features is the cruelty practised upon the poor creatures, by husbands and fathers, real bluebeards and timons, who resist the most touching appeals made for diamonds, by their wives and their daughters and leave them for days, unsupplied with new jewellery, fans or bouquets, even laugh at their misery whenever they have a chance, and deride their demands as useless extravagance. One case of a bride was brought to my view, too sad for belief, but alas, t'was too true, whose husband refused, as savage as Charon, to permit her to take more than ten trunks to Sharon. The consequence was that when she got there, at the end of three weeks she had nothing to wear, and when she proposed to finish the season at Newport, the monster refused out and out, for his infamous conduct alleging no reason, except that the waters were good for the, his gout. Such treatment as this was too shocking, of course, and proceedings are now going on for divorce. But why harrow the feelings by lifting the curtain from these scenes of woe? Enough, it is certain, has here been disclosed to stir up the pity of every benevolent heart in the city and spur up humanity into a canter to rush and relieve these sad cases in stanter. Would somebody, moved by this touching description, come forward to-morrow and head a subscription? Won't some kind philanthropist, seeing that aid is so needed at once by these indigent ladies, take charge of the matter? Or won't Peter Cooper, the cornerstone lay of some new splendid super structure like that which to-day links his name in the union unending of honour and fame, and found a new charity just for the care of these unhappy women with nothing to wear, which, in view of the cash which would daily be claimed, the laying-out hospital well might be named. Won't Stuart or some of our dry goods importers take a contract for clothing our wives and our daughters, or to furnish the cash to supply these distresses, and life's pathway strew with shawls, collars, and dresses, ere the want of them makes it much rougher and thornier? Won't someone discover a new California? O oh, ladies, dear ladies, the next sunny day, please trundle your hoops just out of Broadway, from its swirl and its bustle, its fashion and pride, 
and the temples of trade which tower on each side to the alleys and lanes where misfortune and guilt their children have gathered their cities have built where hunger and vice like twin beasts of prey have hunted their victims to gloom and despair raise the rich dainty dress and the fine broidered skirt pick your delicate way through the dampness and dirt grope through the dark dens climb the rickety stair to the garrets where wretches the young and the old half starved and half naked lie crouched from the cold see those skeletal limbs those frost-bitten feet all bleeding and bruised by the stones of the street hear the sharp cry of childhood the deep groans that swell from the poor dying creature who writhes on the floor hear the curses that sound like the echoes of hell as you sicken and shudder and fly from the door then home to your wardrobes and say if you dare spoiled children of fashion you've nothing to wear and oh if perchance there should be a sphere where all is made right which so puzzles us here where the glare and the glitter and tinsel of time fade and die in the light of that region sublime where the soul disenchanted of flesh and of sense unscreened by its trappings and shows and pretence must be clothed for the life and the service above with purity truth faith meekness and love o daughters of earth foolish virgins beware lest in that upper realm you have nothing to wear end of nothing to wear Eleven of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melanie Ward. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. Edited by Thomas Lansing Mason. A boy's essay on girls, uncredited. Girls are very stuck up and dignified in their manner and behavior. They think more of dress than anything and like to play with dolls and rags. They cry if they see a cow in a far distance and are afraid of guns. They stay at home all the time and go to church every Sunday. They are always sick. They are always funny and making fun of boys' hands, and they say, how dirty. They can't play marbles. I pity them, poor things. They make fun of boys and then turn around and love them. I don't believe they ever killed a cat or anything. They look out every night and say, oh, ain't the moon lovely. There is one thing I have not told and that is they always know their lessons better than boys end of a boy's essay on girls recording by melanie ward chapter 12 of little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Mason. Deacon Marble by Henry Ward Beecher. How they ever made a deacon out of Jerry Marble, I never could imagine. He was the kindest heart that ever bubbled and ran over. He was elastic, tough, incessantly active, and a prodigious worker. He seemed never to tire, but after the longest day's toil, he sprang up the moment he had done with work, as if he were a fine steel spring. A few hours' sleep sufficed him, and he saw the morning stars the year round. His weazened face was leather color but forever dimpling and changing to keep some sort of congruity between itself and his eyes that winked and blinked and spill over with merry good nature he always seemed afflicted when obliged to be sober he had been known to laugh in meeting on several occasions although he ran his face behind his handkerchief and, and coughed as if that were the matter yet nobody believed it once in a hot summer day he saw deacon trowbridge a sober and fat man of great sobriety gradually ascending from the bodily state into that spiritual condition called sleep 
he was blameless of the act he had struggled against the temptation with the whole virtue of a deacon he had eaten two or three heads of fennel in vain and a piece of orange peel he had stirred himself up and fixed his eyes on the minister with intense firmness only to have them grow gradually narrower and milder if he held his head up firmly it would with a sudden lapse fall away over backward if he leaned it a little forward it would drop suddenly into his bosom at each nod recovering himself he would nod again with his eyes wide open to impress upon the boys that he did it on purpose both times in what other painful event of life has a good man so little sympathy as when overcome with sleep in meeting time against the insidious seduction he arrays every conceivable resistance he stands up a while he pinches himself or pricks himself with pins he looks up helplessly to the pulpit as if some sucker might come thence he crosses his legs uncomfortably and attempts to recite the catechism or or the multiplication table he seizes a languid fan which treacherously leaves him in a calm he tries to reason to notice the phenomena oh that one could carry his pew to bed with him what tossing wakefulness there what fiery chase after somnolency in his lawful bed a man cannot sleep and in his pew he cannot keep awake happy man who does not sleep in church deacon trowbridge was not that man deacon marble was deacon marble witnessed the conflict we have sketched above and when good mr trowbridge gave his next lurch recovering himself with a snort and then drew out a red handkerchief and blew his nose with a loud imitation as if to let the boys know that he had not been asleep poor deacon marble was brought to a sore strait but i have reason to think that he would have weathered the stress of it had it not been for a sweet-faced little boy in the front of the gallery the lad had been innocently watching the same scene and at its climax laughed out loud with a frank and musical explosion and then suddenly disappeared backward into his mother's lap that laugh was just too much and deacon marble could no more help laughing than could deacon trowbridge help sleeping nor could he conceal it though he coughed and put up his handkerchief and hemmed it was a laugh deacon and every boy in the house knew it and liked you better for it so inexperienced were they norwood end of section twelve Thirteen of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Mason. The Deacon's Trout by Henry Ward Beecher it was a curious trout i believe he knew sunday just as well as deacon marble did at any rate the deacon thought the trout meant to aggravate him the deacon you know is a little waggish he often tells about the trout says he one sunday morning just as i got along by the willows i heard an awful splash and not ten feet from shore i saw the trout as long as my arm just curving over like a bow and going down with something for breakfast uh, gracious says i and i almost jumped out of the wagon but my wife polly says she what on earth are you thinking of deacon it's sabbath day and you're going to meetin it's a pretty business for a deacon well that sort of cooled me off but i do say that for about a minute i wished i wasn't a deacon but twouldn't make any difference for i came down next day to mill on purpose and i came down once or twice more and nothing was to be seen 
though i tried him with the most tempting things all next sunday i came along again and to save my life i couldn't keep off worldly wandering thoughts i tried to be saying my catechism but i couldn't keep my eyes off the pond as we came up to the willows i got along in the catechism as smooth as the road to the fourth commandment and was saying it out loud for polly and just as i was saying what is required in the fourth commandment i heard a splash and there was the trout and afore i could think i said gracious polly i must have that trout she almost riz right up i knew you want to say in your catechism hearty is this the way you answer the question about keeping the lord's day i'm ashamed deacon marble says she you'd better change your mind and go to meetin on the road over the hill if i was a deacon i wouldn't let a fish tail whisk the whole catechism out of my head and i had to go to meetin on the hill road all the rest of the summer norwood in of section thirteen of little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one edited by thomas lansing mason the dog noble and the empty hole by henry ward beecher the first summer which we spent in lennox we had along a very intelligent dog named noble he was learned in many things and by his dog lore excited the undying admiration of all the children but there were some things which noble could never learn having on one occasion seen a red squirrel run into a hole in a stone wall he could not be persuaded that he was not there for evermore several red squirrels lived close to the house and had become familiar but not tame they kept up a regular romp with noble they would come down from the maple trees with provoking coolness they would run along the fence almost within reach they would cock their tails and sail across the road to the barn and yet there was such a well-timed calculation under all this apparent rashness that noble invariably arrived at the critical spot just as the squirrel left it on one occasion noble was so close upon his red-backed friend that unable to get up the maple tree the squirrel dodged into a hole in the wall ran through the chinks emerged at a little distance and sprang into the tree the intense enthusiasm of the dog at that hole can hardly be described he filled it full of barking he pawed and scratched as if undermining a bastion standing off at a little distance he would pierce the hole with a gaze as intense and fixed as if he were trying magnetism on it then with tail extended and every hair thereon electrified he would rush at the empty hole with a prodigious onslaught this imaginary squirrel haunted noble night and day the very squirrel himself would run up before his face into the tree and crouched in a crotch would sit silently watching the whole process of bombarding the empty hole with great sobriety and relish but noble would allow of no doubts his conviction that the hole had a squirrel in it continued unshaken for six weeks when all other occupations failed this hole remained to him when there were no more chickens to harry no pigs to bite no cattle to chase no children to romp with no expeditions to make with the grown folks and when he had slept all that his dog-skin would hold he would walk out of the yard yawn and stretch himself and then look wistfully at the hole as if thinking to himself well as there is nothing else to do i may as well try that hole again eyes and ears n p 
Willis was usually the life of the company he happened to be in. His repartee at Mrs. Gale's dinner in Washington is famous. Mrs. Gales wrote on a card to her niece at the other end of the table, Don't flirt so with Nat Willis. She was herself talking vivaciously to a Mr. Campbell. Willis wrote the niece's reply. Dear aunt, don't attempt my young feelings to trammel, nor strain at a gnat while you swallow a camel. End of section 14《of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Putzig, Boston. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Old Grimes by Albert Gorton Green. Old Grimes is dead, that good old man. We never shall see more. He used to wear a long black coat all buttoned down before. His heart was open as the day, his feelings all were true. His hair was some inclined to grey, he wore it in a queue. Whene'er he heard the voice of pain, his breast with pity burned. The large round head upon his cane from ivory was turned. Kind words he ever had for all, he knew no base design. His eyes were dark and rather small, his nose was aquiline. He lived at peace with all mankind, in friendship he was true. His coat had pocket holes behind, his pantaloons were blue. Unharmed the sin which earth pollutes, he passed securely o'er, and never wore a pair of boots for thirty years or more. But good old Grimes is now at rest, nor fears misfortune frown. He wore a double-breasted vest, the stripes ran up and down. He modest merit sought to find, and pay it its desert. He had no malice in his mind, no ruffles on his shirt. His neighbors he did not abuse, was sociable and gay. He wore large buckles on his shoes, and changed them every day. His knowledge hid from public gaze he did not bring to view, nor made a noise town meeting days as many people do. His worldly goods he never threw in trust to fortune's chances, but lived, as all his brothers do, in easy circumstances. Thus undisturbed by anxious cares, his peaceful moments ran, and everybody said he was a fine old gentleman. End of Old Grimes Recording by Alan Putzig, Boston Chapter 16 of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dom Bombadil. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Identified Nathaniel Hawthorne was a kind-hearted man as well as a great novelist. While he was consul at Liverpool, a young Yankee walked into his office. The boy had left home to seek his fortune, but evidently hadn't found it yet, although he had crossed the sea in his search. Homesick, friendless, nearly penniless, he wanted a passage home. The clerk said Mr. Hawthorne could not be seen, and intimated that the boy was not American, but was trying to steal a passage. The boy stuck to his point, and the clerk at last went to the little room and said to Mr. Hawthorne, Here's a boy who insists upon seeing you. He says he is an American, but I know he isn't. Hawthorne came out of the room and looked keenly at the eager, ruddy face of the boy. You want a passage to America? Yes, sir. And you say you're an American? Yes, sir. From what part of America? United States, sir. What state? New Hampshire, sir. Town? Exeter, sir. Hawthorne looked at him for a minute before asking him the next question. Who sold the best apples in your town? 
Skim milk wholesome, sir, said the boy with glistening eye, as the old familiar byword brought up dear old scenes of home. It's all right, said Hawthorne to the clerk. Give him a passage. End of Identified of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dom Bombadil. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. One Better long after the victories of washington over the french and english had made his name familiar to all europe dr franklin chanced to dine with the english and french ambassadors when as nearly as the precise words can be recollected the following toasts were drunk england the sun whose bright beams enlighten and fructify the remotest corners of the earth the french ambassador filled with national pride but too polite to dispute the previous toast, drank the following. France, the moon, whose mild, steady, and cheering rays are the delight of all nations, consoling them in darkness and making their dreariness beautiful. Dr. Franklin then arose, and with his usual dignified simplicity said, George Washington, the Joshua, who commanded the sun and moon to stand still, and they obeyed him. End of One Better Teen of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dom Bombadil Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson My Aunt by Oliver Wendell Holmes My aunt, my dear unmarried aunt, Long years have overflown, Yet still she strains the aching glass That binds her virgin zone. I know it hurts her, though she looks As cheerful as she can, her waist is ambler than her life, for life is but a span. My aunt, my poor deluded aunt, her hair is almost grey. Why will she train that winter curl in such a spring-like way? How can she lay her glasses down and say she reads as well, when through a double convex lens she just makes out to spell? Her father, grandpapa, forgive this erring lips his smiles vowed she would make the finest girl within a hundred miles he sent her to a stylish school it was in her thirteenth june and with her as the rules required two towels and a spoon they braced my aunt against the board to make her straight and tall they laced her up they starved her down to make her light and small they pinched her feet they singed her hair they screwed it up with pins Oh, never mortal suffered more in penance for her sins. So, when my precious aunt was done, my grandsire brought her back, by daylight, lest some rabid youth might follow on the track. Ah, said my grandsire, as he shook some powder in his pan, what could this lovely creature do against a desperate man? Alas, no chariot, no baroque, no bandit cavalcade, tore from the trembling father's arms his all-accomplished mate. For her, how happy had it been! And heaven had spared to me to see one sad ungathered rose on my ancestral tree. End of My Aunt Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Joe Sela. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Miss Albina McLush. I have a passion for fat women. If there is anything I hate in life, it is what dainty people call a spirituelle. Motion, rapid motion, a smart, quick, squirrel-like step, a pert, voluble tone. In short, a lively girl is my exquisite horror. I would as lief have a diable petite dancing his infernal hornpipe on my cerebellum as to be in the room with one. I have tried before now to school myself into liking these parched peas of humanity. I have followed them with my eyes and attended to their rattle till I was as crazy as a fly in a drum. I have danced with them and romped with them in the country and periled the salvation of my white tights by sitting near them at supper. I swear off from this moment. I do. I won't. No. Hang me if I ever show another small, lively, spry woman a civility. Albina McLush is divine. She is like the description of the Persian beauty by Hafiz. Her heart is full of passion, and her eyes are full of sleep. She is the sister of Lurley McLush, my old college chum, who as early as his sophomore year was chosen president of the Dolce Far Niente Society, no member of which was ever known to be surprised at anything. The college law of rising before breakfast accepted. Lurley introduced me to his sister one day, as he was lying upon a heap of turnips, leaning on his elbow with his head in his hand, in a green lane in the suburbs. He had driven over a stump and been tossed out of his gig, and I came up just as he was wondering how in damsel's name he got there. Albina sat quietly in the gig, and when I was presented, requested me, with a delicious straw, to say nothing about the adventure. It would be so troublesome to relate it to everybody. I loved her from that moment. Miss McLush was tall, and her shape, of its kind, was perfect. It was not a fleshy one exactly, but she was large and full. Her skin was clear, fine-grained, and transparent, her temples and forehead perfectly rounded and polished, and her lips and chin swelling into a ripe and tempting pout like the cleft of a bursted apricot. And then her eyes, large, liquid, and sleepy, they languished beneath their long black fringes if they had no business with daylight, like two magnificent dreams, surprised in their jet embryos by some bird-nesting cherub. Oh, it was lovely to look into them. She sat usually upon a fauteuil, with her large, full arm embedded in the cushion, sometimes for hours without stirring. I have seen the wind lift the masses of dark hair from her shoulders when it seemed like the coming to life of a marble hebe. She had been motionless so long. She was a model for a goddess of sleep as she sat with her eyes half closed, lifting up their superb lids slowly as you spoke to her, and dropping them again with the deliberate motion of a cloud when she had murmured out her syllable of assent. Her figure in a sitting posture presented a gentle declivity from the curve of her neck to the instep of the small round foot lying on its side upon the ottoman. I remember a fellow's bringing her a plate of fruit one evening. He was one of your lively men, a horrid monster, all right angles and activity. Having never been accustomed to hold her own plate, she had not well extricated her whole fingers from her handkerchief before he set it down on her lap. As it began to slide slowly toward her feet, her hand relapsed into the muslin folds, and she fixed her eye upon it with a kind of indolent surprise, drooping her lids gradually till, as the fruit scattered over the ottoman, they closed entirely and a liquid jet line was alone visible through the heavy lashes. There was an imperial indifference in it worthy of Juno. Miss McLush rarely walks. When she does, it is with the deliberate majesty of a dido. Her small, plump feet melt to the ground like snowflakes, and her figure sways to the indolent motion of her limbs with a glorious grace and yieldingness quite indescribable. She was idling slowly up the mall one evening just at twilight, with a servant at a short distance behind her, who, to while away the time between his steps, was employing himself in throwing stones at the cows feeding upon the common. A gentleman, with a natural admiration for her splendid person, addressed her. He might have done a more eccentric thing. Without troubling herself to look at him, she turned to her servant and requested him, with a yawn of desperate ennui, to knock that fellow down. John obeyed his orders, and as his mistress resumed her lounge, picked up a new handful of pebbles, and tossing one at the nearest cow, loitered lazily after. Such supreme indolence was irresistible. I gave in, I, who never before could summon energy to sigh, I, to whom a declaration was but a synonym for perspiration, I, who had only thought of love as a nervous complaint, and of women but to pray for a good deliverance. I, yes, I, knocked under. Albina McLush 
thou wert too exquisitely lazy human sensibilities cannot hold out forever i found her one morning sipping her coffee at twelve with her eyes wide open she was just from the bath and her complexion had a soft dewy transparency like the cheek of venus rising from the sea it was the hour lurley had told me when she would be at the trouble of thinking she put away with her dimpled forefinger as i entered a cluster of rich curls that had fallen over her face and nodded to me like a water lily swaying to the wind when its cup is full of rain lady albina said i in my softest tone how are you patina said she addressing her maid in a voice as clouded and rich as the south wind on an aeolian how am i today the conversation fell into short sentences the dialogue became a monologue i entered upon my declaration with the assistance of Bettina, who supplied her mistress with cologne, I kept her attention alive through the incipient circumstances. Symptoms were soon told. I came to the avowal. Her hand lay reposing on the arm of the sofa, half buried in a muslin foulard. I took it up and pressed the cool soft fingers to my lips. Unforbidden. I rose and looked into her eyes for confirmation. Delicious creature. She was asleep. I never have had courage to renew the subject. Miss McLush seems to have forgotten it altogether. Upon reflection, too, I'm convinced she would not survive the excitement of the ceremony, unless, indeed, she should sleep between the responses and the prayer. I am still devoted, however, and if there should come a war or an earthquake, or if the millennium should commence, as is expected in 18-something-something, or if anything happens that can keep her waking so long, I shall deliver a declaration, abbreviated for me by a scholar friend of mine, which, he warrants, may be articulated in fifteen minutes, without fatigue written by n p willis recording by joe sela chapter 20 of little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by joe sela Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Section 20, by William Pitt Palmer. A Smack in School A district school not far away, mid Berkshire Hills one winter's day, was humming with its wanted noise of threescore mingled girls and boys. Some few upon their tasks intent, but more on furtive mischief bent. The while the master's downward look was fastened on a copy-book, when suddenly behind his back rose sharp and clear a rousing smack, as twere a battery of bliss let off in one tremendous kiss. What's that? the startled master cries. That thur, a little imp replies, with William Willith, if you pleath, I thaw him kith to Thana Peeth. With frown to make a statue thrill, the master thundered, Hither will. Like wretch o'ertaken in his track, with stolen shadows on his back, Will hung his head in fear and shame and to the awful presence came a great green bashful simpleton the butt of all good-natured fun with smile suppressed and birch upraised the thunderer faltered i'm amazed that you my biggest pupil should be guilty of an act so rude before the whole set school to boot what evil genius put you to it twas she herself sir sobbed the lad i did not mean to be so bad but when susanna shook her curls and whispered i was afraid of girls and durnt's kiss a baby's doll i couldn't stand it sir at all but up and kissed her on the spot i know boo-hoo i ought to not but somehow from her looks boo-hoo i thought she kind of wished me to william pitt palmer end of a smack in school recording by joe Sela. little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Sela. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Section 21. A Rendition. By Anonymous. Two old British sailors were talking over their shore experience. One had been to a cathedral and had heard some very fine music, and was descanting particularly upon an anthem which gave him much pleasure. His shipmate listened for a while, and then said, "'I say, Bill, what's a hantham?' "'What?' replied Bill. 
Do you mean to say you don't know what a hantham is? Not me. Well, then I'll tell yer. If I was to tell yer, ear, Bill, give me that and spike, that wouldn't be a hantham. But was I to say, Bill, Bill, give, give, give me, give me that, Bill, give me, give me that hand, hand spike, hand, hand spike, 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 spike. Ah, men, amen, ah, Bill, give me that hand spike, spike, amen. Ah, Why, that would be a hantham. End of a Redition. Recording by Joe Sela. Pieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lanson Masson. Fancy Diseases by B. P. Shillaber, Mrs. Partington. Diseases is very various, said Mrs. Partington, as she returned from a street-door conversation with Dr. Bolus. The doctor tells me that poor old Mrs. Hayes has got two buckles on her lungs. It is dreadful to think of, I declare. The diseases is so various. One way we hear of people's dying of hermitage of the lungs, another way of the brown creatures. Here they tell us of the elementary canal being out of order, and there about tonsils of the throat. Here we hear of neurology in the head, there of an embargo. One side of us we hear of men being killed by getting a pound of tough beef in the sarcophagus, and there another kills himself by discovering his jocular vein. Things change so that I declare I don't know how to subscribe for any diseases nowadays. New names and new nostrils takes the place of the old. I might as well throw my old herb bag away. Fifteen minutes afterward, Isaac had that herb bag for a target, and broke three squares of glass in the cellar window in trying to hit it, before the old lady knew what he was about. She didn't mean exactly what she said. End of chapter 22 Read by Kim Of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson Bailed out by B. P. Shillaber, Mrs. Partington. So our neighbour, Mr. Guzzle, has been arranged at the bar for drunkardice, said Mrs. Partington, and she sighed at the thought of his wife and children at home, with the cold weather close at hand, and the searching winds intruding through the chinks in the windows, and waving the tattered curtains like a banner, where the little one stood shivering by the faint embers. God forgive him and pity them, said she, in a tone of voice tremulous with emotion. But he was bailed out, said Ike, who had devoured the residue of the paragraph, and he laid the paper in a pan of liquid custard that the dame was preparing for Thanksgiving, and sat swinging the oven door to and fro, as if to fan the fire that crackled and blazed within. Bailed out, was he, said she. Well, I think it would have been cheaper to have pumped him out, for when our cellar was filled after the city fathers had degraded the street, we had to have it pumped out, though there wasn't half so much in it as he has swilled down. She paused and reached up on the high shelves of the closet for her pie plates, while Ike busied himself in tasting the various preparations. The dame thought that that was the smallest quart of cider that she had ever seen. End of chapter 23 4 of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kim Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson Chapter 24 Seeking a Comet by B. P. Shillaber Mrs. Partington It was with an anxious feeling that Mrs. Partington, having smoked her specks, directed her gaze towards the western sky in quest of the tailless comet of 1850. I can't see it, said she, in a shade of vexation that was perceptible in the tone of her voice. I don't think much of this explanatory system, continued she, that they pray so, where the stars are mixed up so that I can't tell Jew Peter from Satan, nor the consternation of the great bear from the man in the moon. Tis all dark to me. I don't believe there's any comet at all. Who ever heard of a comet without a tail? 
I should like to know. It isn't natural. But the printers will make a tale for it fast enough, for they are always getting up comical stories. With a complaint about the falling dew and a slight murmur of disappointment, the dame disappeared behind a deal door like the moon behind a cloud. End of chapter 24《Of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Merson. Chapter 25 Going to California by B. P. Shillaber, Mrs. Partington. Dear me, exclaimed Mrs. Partington sorrowfully, how much will a man bear, and how far will he go, to get the sodded dross, as Parson Martin called it, when he refused the beggar a sixpence, for fear it might lead him into extravagance? Everybody is going to California, and charge an art of gold. Cousin Jones and the three Smiths have gone, and Mr. Chip, the carpenter, has left his wife and seven children, and a blessed old mother-in-law, to seek his fortune too. This is the strangest yet, and I don't see how he could have done it. It looks so ungrateful to treat heaven's blessings so lightly. But there we are told that the love of money is the root of all evil. And how true it is, for they are now rooting after it like pigs are to ground nuts. Why, it is a perfect money mania among everybody. And she shook her head doubtingly as she pensively watched a small mug of cider with an apple in it simmering by the winter fire. She was somewhat fond of a drink made in this way. End of chapter 25 of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Mrs. Partington in Court, by B. P. Shillaber, Mrs. Partington. I took my knitting work and went up into the gallery, said Mrs. Partington, the day after visiting one of the city courts. I went up into the gallery, and after I had adjusted my specs, I looked down into the room, but I couldn't see any courting going on. An old gentleman seemed to be asking a good many impertinent questions, just like some old folks, and people were sitting around making minutes of the conversation. I don't see how they made out what was said, for they all told different stories. How much easier it would be to get along if they were all made to tell the same story. What a sight of trouble it would save the lawyers. The case, as they call it, was given to the jury, but I couldn't see it, and the gentleman with the long pole was made to swear that he'd keep an eye on them, and see that they didn't run away with it. Bimby, in they came again, and they said somebody was guilty of something, who had just said he was innocent, and didn't know nothing about it no more than the little baby that had never substance. I came away soon afterward, but I couldn't help thinking how trying it must be to sit there all day shut out from the blessed air. Apropos of Superintendent Andrews' reported objection to the singing of the recessional in the Chicago public schools on the ground that the atheists might be offended, the Chicago Post says, For the benefit of our skittish friends, the atheists, and in order not to deprive the public school children of the literary beauties of certain poems that may be classed by Dr. Andrews as hymns, we venture to suggest this compromise, taking a few lines in illustration from our national anthem. Our Father's God, assuming purely for the sake of argument that there is a God, to thee, author of liberty, with apologies to our friends the atheists, to thee I sing, but we needn't mean it, you know. Long may our land be bright, with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might. Remember this is purely hypothetical. Great God, again assuming that there is a God, our King, simply an allegorical phrase, and not intended offensively to any taxpayer. End of chapter 26. Read by Kim. To twenty seven of Little Master's Pieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson.
Section twenty seven. Apropos of Superintendent Andrews's reported objection to the singing of the recessional in the Chicago public schools on the ground that the atheists might be offended, the Chicago Post says, For the benefit of our skittish friends, the atheists, and in order not to deprive the public school children of the literary beauties of certain poems that may be classed by Dr. Andrews as hymns, we venture to suggest this compromise, taking a few lines in illustration from our national anthem. Quote, our father's God, assuming purely for the sake of argument that there is a God, to thee, author of liberty, with apologies to our friends the atheists, to thee I sing, but we needn't mean it, you know, long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light, protect us by thy might remember this is purely hypothetical great god assuming that there is a god our king simply an allegorical phrase and not intending offensively to any taxpayer end, quote. end of section 27「Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. « Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Mason. The Deacon's Masterpiece, or The Wonderful One Hoss Shea, by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Have you ever heard of the wonderful One Hoss Shea that was built in such a logical way? It ran a hundred years to a day, and then, of a sudden, it, ah, uh, but stay. I'll tell you what happened without delay. Scaring the parson into fits, frightening people out of their wits, have you ever heard of that, I say? 1755. George Secundus was then alive, snuffy old drone from the German hive. That was the year when Lisbon town saw the earth open and gulp her down. And Braddock's army was done so brown, left without a scalp to its crown. It was on the terrible earthquake day that the deacon finished the one hoss shay now in building of chases i tell you what there is always somewhere a weakest spot in hub tire fellow in spring or thill in panel or crossbar or floor or sill in screw bolt thorough brace lurking still find it somewhere you must and will above or below or within or without and that's the reason beyond a doubt that a chase breaks down but doesn't wear out but the deacon swore as deacons do with an i do them or i tell ye he would build one shade to beat the town in the county in all the county round it should be so built that it couldn't break down fur said the deacon tis mighty plain that the weakest place must stand the strain and the way to fix it is i maintain is only just to make that place as strong as the rest so the deacon inquired of the village folk where he could find the strongest oak that couldn't be split nor bent nor broke that was for spokes and floor and sills he sent for lancewood to make the thills the crossbars were ash from the straightest trees the panels of white wood that cuts like cheese but last like iron for things like these the hubs of logs from settlers elam last of its timber they couldn't sell em never an axe had seen their chips and the wedges flew from between their lips their blunt ends frizzled like celery tips step and prop iron bolt and screw spring tire axle and linchpin too steel of the finest bright and blue thorough brace bison skin thick and wide boot top dasher from tough old hide found in the pit where the tanner died that was the way he put her through there said the deacon now she'll do 
do i tell you i rather guess she was a wonder and nothing less colts grew horses beards turned gray deacon and deaconess dropped away children and grandchildren where were they but there stood the stout old one hoss shay as fresh as on lisbon earthquake day eighteen hundred it came and found the deacon's masterpiece strong and sound eighteen hundred increased by ten and some carriage they called it then eighteen hundred and twenty came running as usual much the same thirty and forty at last arrived and then came fifty and fifty-five little of all we value here uh, wakes on the morn of its hundredth year without both feeling and looking queer in fact there's nothing that keeps its youth so far as i know but a tree and truth this is a moral that runs at large take it you're welcome no extra charge first of november the earthquake day there are traces of age in the one hoss shay a general flavor of mild decay but nothing local as one may say there couldn't be for the deacon's art had made it so like in every part that there wasn't a chance for one to start for the wheels were just as strong as the thills and the floor was just as strong as the sills and the panels just as strong as the floor and the whipple tree neither less nor more and the back cross bar as strong as the fore and spring and axle and hub encore and yet as a whole it is past a doubt in another hour it will be worn out first of november fifty five this morning the parson takes a drive now small boys get out of the way here comes the wonderful one hoss shay drawn by a rat-tailed ewe-necked bay but up said the parson off went they the parson was working his sunday's text had got to fifthly and stopped perplexed at what the moses was coming next all at once the horse stood still close by the meeting house on the hill first a shiver and then a thrill then something decidedly like a spill and the parson was sitting upon a rock at half past nine by the meeting house clock just the hour of the earthquake shock what do you think the parson found when he got up and stared around the poor old chase in a heap or mound as if it had been to the mill and ground you see of course if you're not a dunce how it went to pieces all at once all at once and nothing first just as bubbles do when they burst end of the wonderful one hoss shay logic is logic that's all i say End of section 28 Of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one edited by thomas lansing mason the five lives by edward roland seal five mites of monads dwelt in a round drop that twinkled on a leaf by a pool in the sun to the naked eye they lived invisible specks for a world of whom the empty shell of a mustard seed had been a hollow sky one was a meditative monad called a sage and shrinking all his mind within he thought tradition handed down for hours and hours tells that our globe this quivering crystal world is slowly dying what if seconds hence when i am very old yon shimmering doom comes drawing down and down till all things end then with a wizened smirk he proudly felt no other moat of god had ever gained such giant grasp of universal truth one was a transcendental monad thin and long and slim of mind and thus he mused o oh, vast unfathomable monad souls made in the image 
a hoarse frog croaks from the pool hark twas some god voicing his glorious thought in thunder music yea we hear their voice and we may guess their minds from ours their work some taste they have like ours some tendency to wriggle about and munch a trace of scum he floated up on a pinpoint bubble of gas that burst pricked by the air and he was gone one was a barren-minded monad called a positivist and he knew positively there was no world beyond this certain drop prove me another let the dreamers dream or their faint gleams and noises from without and higher and lower life is life enough then swaggering half a hair's breadth hungrily he seized upon an atom of a bug and fed one was a tattered monad called a poet and with a shrill voice ecstatic thus he sang o little female monad's lips o little female monad's eyes ah the little little female female monad the last was a strong-minded monadus who dashed amid the infusoria danced high and low and wildly spun and dove till the dizzy others held their breath to see but while they led their wondrous little lives aeonian moments had gone wheeling by the burning drop had shrunk with fearful speed a glistening film twas gone the leaf was dry the little ghost of an inaudible squeak was lost to the frog that goggled from his stone who at the huge slow tread of a thoughtful ox coming to drink stirred sideways flatly plunged launched backward twice and all the pool was still end of section twenty nine Of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Wilson. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. The Owl Critic, A Lesson to Fault Finders, by James T. Fields. Who stuffed that white owl? No one spoke in the shop. The barber was busy, and he couldn't stop. The customers, waiting their turns, were all reading the Daily, the Herald, the Post, little heeding. The young man who blurted out such a blunt question, not one raised a head, or even made a suggestion and the barber kept on shaving. "'Don't you see, Mr. Brown?' cried the youth with a frown. "'How wrong the whole thing is, how preposterous each wing is, how flattened the head is, how jammed down the neck is. In short, the whole owl, what an ignorant wreck tis. I make no apology. I've learned owl eology. I've passed days and nights in a hundred collections, and cannot be blinded to any deflections arising from unskillful fingers that fail to stuff a bird right from his beak to his tail. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, do take that bird down, or you'll soon be the laughing stock all over town. And the barber kept on shaving. I've studied owls and other night fowls, and I tell you what I know to be true. An owl cannot roost with his limbs so unloosed. No owl in this world ever had his claws curled, ever had his legs slanted, ever had his bill canted, ever had his neck screwed into that attitude. He can't do it, because tis against all bird laws. Anatomy teaches, ornithology preaches, an owl has a toe that can't turn out so. I've made the white owl my study for years, and to see such a job almost moves me to tears. Mr. Brown, I'm amazed you should be so gone crazed as to put up a bird in that posture absurd. 
To look at that owl really brings on a dizziness. The man who stuffed him don't half know his business. And the barber kept on shaving. Examine those eyes. I'm filled with surprise. Taxidermists should pass off on you such poor glass. So unnatural they seem, they'd make Audubon scream, and John Burroughs laugh to encounter such chaff. Do take that bird down, have him stuffed again, Brown. And the barber kept on shaving. With some sawdust and bark, I would stuff in the dark an owl better than that. I could make an old hat look more like an owl than that horrid fowl stuck up there so stiff like a side of coarse leather in fact about him there's not one natural feather just then with a wink and a sly normal lurch the owl very gravely got down from his perch walked round and regarded his fault-finding critic who thought he was stuffed with a glance analytic and then fairly hooted as if he should say your learnings at fault this time anyway don't waste it again on a live bird i pray i'm an owl you're another sir critic good day and the barber kept on shaving end of the owl critic a lesson to fault finders Thirty one of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Prusco, www.brianprusco.com. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. A Cause for Thanks. A country parson, in encountering a storm the past season in the voyage across the Atlantic, was reminded of the following. A clergyman was so unfortunate as to be caught in a severe gale in the voyage out. The water was exceedingly rough, and the ship persistently buried her nose in the sea. The rolling was constant, and at last the good man got thoroughly frightened. He believed they were destined for a watery grave. He asked the captain if he could not have prayers. The captain took him by the arm and led him down to the forecastle, where the tars were singing and swearing. There, said he, when you hear them swearing, you may know there is no danger. He went back feeling better, but the storm increased his alarm. Disconsolate and unassisted, he managed to stagger to the forecastle again. The ancient mariners were swearing as ever. Mary, he said to his sympathetic wife, as he crawled into his berth after tacking across a wet deck. Mary, thank God they're swearing yet. End of A Cause for Thanks. Section 32 of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Section 32. Little Britches by John Hay. I don't go much on religion. I never ain't had no show. But I've got a middle and tight grip, sir, on the handful of things I know. I don't pan out on the prophets and free will and that sort of thing. But I believe in God and the angels ever since one night last spring. I come into town with some turnips, and my little Gabe come along. No four-year-old in the country could beat him for pretty and strong, pert and chipper and sassy, always ready to swear and fight. And I learnt him to chaw tobacco just to keep his milk teeth white. The snow come down like a blanket as I passed by Taggart's store. I went in for a jug of molasses and left the team at the door. They scared at something and started. I heard one little squall, and hell to split over the prairie went team, little breeches and all. Hell to split over the prairie, 
i was almost froze with skier but we rousted up some torches and searched for em far and near at last we struck horses and wagon snowed under a soft white mound upsot dead beat but of little gabe nor hide nor hair was found and here all hope soured on me of my fellow critter's aid i just flopped down on my marrow bones crouched deep in the snow and prayed by this the torches was played out and me and israel parr went off for some wood to a sheepfold that he said was somewhere there we found it at last and a little shed where they shut up the lambs at night we looked in and seen them huddled there so warm and sleepy and white and there sought little breeches and chirped as pert as ever you see i want a char of tobacco and that's what's the matter of me how did he get there angels he could never have walked in that storm they just scooped down and toted him to where it was safe and warm and i think that saving a little child and bringing him to his own is a darn sight better business than loafing around the throne artemus ward when in london gave a children's party one of john bright's sons was invited and returned home radiant oh papa he explained on being asked whether he had enjoyed himself indeed i did and mr brown gave me such a nice name for you papa what was that why he asked me how that gay and festive cuss the governor was replied the boy it was on a train going through indiana among the passengers were a newly married couple who made themselves known to such an extent that the occupants of the car commenced passing sarcastic remarks about them the bride and groom stood the remarks for some time but finally the latter who was a man of tremendous size broke out in the following language at his tormentors yes we're married just married we are going a hundred and sixty miles farther and i am going to spoon all the way if you don't like it you can get out and walk she's my violet and i'm her sheltering oak during the remainder of the journey they were left in peace end of little britches by john hay Chapter 33 of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Sela. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Natural and Unnatural Aristocrats. Written by Henry W. Shaw, a.k.a. Josh Billings. Nature finishes all the noblemen we have. She holds a patent. Pedigree has no more to do in making a man actually greater than he is than a peacock's feather in his hat has in making him actually taller. This is a hard fact for some to learn. This mundane earth is thick with male and female ones who think they are great because their ancestors was lucky in the soap or tobacco trade, and although the soap has run out some time since, they try to fool themselves and other folks with the suds. Soap suds is a precarious bubble. There ain't nothing so thin on the ribs as soap suds aristocrat. When the world stands in need of an aristocrat, nature pitches one into it and furnishes him papers without any flaw in them. Aristocracy can't be transmitted. Nature says so in the papers. Titles are a plan got up by humans to assist nature in promulgating aristocracy. Titles ain't of any more real use or necessity than dog collars are. I have seen dog collars that cost three dollars on dogs that weren't worth, in any market, over eighty-seven and a half cents. This is a great waste of collar and a great damage to the dog. Nature don't put but one ingredient in their kind of aristocracy, and that is virtue. She wets up the virtue sometimes with a little pepper sass just to make it lively. She says that all other kinds are false, and I believe nature. I wish every man and woman on earth was a bloated aristocrat, bloated with virtue. Earthly manufactured aristocrats are made principally out of money. Forty years ago it took about $85,000 to make a good-sized aristocrat and inoculate his family with the same disease, but it takes now about 600000 to throw the parties into fits. Aristocracy, like the other breadstuffs, has riz. It don't take any more virtue to make an aristocrat now, nor clothes, than it did in the days of Abraham. 
Virtue don't vary. Virtue is the standard of values. Clothes ain't. Titles ain't. A man can go barefoot and be virtuous and be an aristocrat. Diagonese was an aristocrat. His brown stun front was a tub, and it went on end at that. Moneyed aristocracy is very good to live on in the present high condition of codfish and wearing apparel, provided you see the money, but if the money kind of ties out and don't reach you, and you don't get anything but the aristocracy, you had got to diet, that's all. I know of thousands who are now dieting an aristocracy. They say it tastes good. I presume they lie without knowing it. Not any of this sort of aristocracy for Joshua Billings. I never should think of mixing money and aristocracy together. I will take mine separate, if you please. I don't never expect to be an aristocrat nor an angel. I don't know as I want to be one. I certainly should make a miserable angel. I certainly never shall have money enough to make an aristocrat. Raising aristocrats is a dreadful poor business. You don't never get your seed back. One Democrat is worth more to the world than 60,000 manufactured aristocrats. An American aristocrat is the most ridiculous thing in the market. They are generally ashamed of their ancestors, and if they have any, and live long enough, they generally have cause to be ashamed of their posterity. I know several families in America who are trying to live on their aristocracy. The money and brains give out some time ago. It is hard scratching for them. You can warm up cold potatoes and live on them, but you can't warm up aristocratic pride and get even a smell. You might as well undertake to raise a crop of corn in a deserted brickyard by manuring the ground heavy with tan bark. Young man, set down and keep still. You'll have plenty of chances yet to make a fool of yourself before you die. End of Natural and Unnatural Aristocrats It is told of an old Baptist parson, famous in Virginia, that he once visited a plantation where the colored servant who met him at the gate asked which barn he would have his horse put in. Have you two barns? asked the minister. Yes, sir, replied the servant. Dar's the old barn, and Master Wales has just built a new one. Where do you usually put the horses of clergymen who come to see your master? Well, sir, if they's Methodists or Baptists, we generally put them in the old barn, but if they's Episcopals, we put them in the new one. Well, Bob, you can put my horse in the new barn. I'm a Baptist, but my horse is an Episcopalian. End of section 33. Recording by Joe Sela. Thirty-four of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Putzig, Boston. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. The Yankee Recruit by James Russell Lowell. Mister Buckingham. The follerin' billet was writ hum by a young feller out of our town that was cussed fool enough to go a trottin' inter mischief arter a drum and fife. It ain't nater for a feller to let on that he's sick o' any business that he went into of his own free will and accord, but I rather calculate he's middle and tired of volunteerin' by this time. I believe you may put dependence on his statements, for I never heard nothin' bad on him, let alone his havin' what Parson Wilbur calls a pong shong for cocktails and says it was a association o idees sought him a goin arter the crootin sergeant cos he wore a cocktail onto his hat his folks gin the letter to me and i shew it to parson wilbur and he says it oughter be printed send it to mr buckingham says he i don't allers agree with him says he but by time says he i do like a feller that ain't afeard i have interspussed a few recollections here and there we are kind of pressed with hayin yours respectfully Hosea Bigelow. This kind of sogerin ain't a mite like our October trainin. A chap could clear right out of there eft only it looked like rainin. And the cunnels too could kiver up their chapoos with bandanners, and send the inside scootin to the barroom with their banners, fear gettin on em spotted. And a feller could cry quarter ef he fired away his ramrod arter too much rum and water. Recollect what fun we had. You and I on Esri Hollis up there to Waltham Plain last fall, having the Cornwallis. This sort of thing ain't just like that. I wished that I was furder. Nine pence a day for killin' folks comes kinda low for murder. Why, I've worked out to slaughter in some for Deacon Cephas Billins, and in the hardest times there was, I always touched ten shillings. There's something gets into my throat that makes it hard to swaller. It comes so narrow to think about a hempen collar. It's glory. 
but in spite of all my trying to get callous, I feel kinda in a cart a riding to the gallus. But when it comes to being killed, I tell you I feel streaked. The first time ever I found out why Baganitz was peaked, here's how it was. I started out to go a fandango. The sentinel, he ups and says, that's further and you can go. None of your sarse, says I. Says he, stand back. Ain't you a buster? Says I, I'm up to all that, I guess I've been to muster. I know why sentinels are sought. You ain't a gun to eat us. Caleb ain't no monopoly to court the senoritas. My folks to hum hair full as good as hisn be, by golly. And so, as I was going by, not thinking what would folly, the everlasting, cause he stuck his one prong pitchfork in me and made a hole right through my close as if I was an in my. Well, it beats all how big I felt who rawin' an old funnel when Mr. Bowles, he gin the sword to our Lieutenant Cunnel. It's Mr. Secondary Bowles that writ the prize peace essay. That's why he didn't list hisself along o' us, I dessay. And Ran Tool, too, he talked pretty loud, but don't put his foot in it, cause human life's so sacred that he's principled to gin it. Though I myself can't rightly see why it's any was a choking on him than putting bullets through their lights or with a bang net poking on him. How dreffle sick he reeled it off, like blitz at our lyceum a hauling ribbons from his chops. So quick you scarcely see him. About the Anglo Saxon race, and Saxons would be handy to do the burying down here upon the Rio Grande. About our patriotic pass and our star spangled banner. Our country's bird a-looking on and singing out Hosanner, and how he, Mr. B himself, was happy for a murky. I felt, as Sister Patience says, a little might hysterky. I felt, I swan, as though it was a dreadful kind of privilege of tramping round through Boston streets among the gutter's drivelage. I actually thought it was a treat to hear little drumming. And it did bona fide see millennium was a-comin', when all on us got suits, darned em like they wore in the state prison, and every feller felt as though all Mexico was his'n. This here's about the meanest place a skunk could wall this kiver. Saltillo's Mexican, I believe, for what we call Salt River. The sort of trash a feller gets to eat do's beat all, matter I'd give a year's pay for a smell of one good blue-nosed tater. The country hears that Mr. Bowles declared to be so charmin' throughout is swarmin' with the most alarmin' kind of armin'. He talked about delicious fruits, but it was a whopper all. The whole once mud and prickly pears, with here and there a chaparral. You see a feller peeking out, and fust you know a Larry Addles round your throat and you a copse. For you can say what air ye at. You never see such darn gret bugs. It may not be irrelevant to say I've seen a scarabaeus pillularius, big as a year old elephant. The regiment come up one day in time to stop a red bug from running off with cunly right. "'Twas just a common Simex lectularius. "'One night I started up on end and thought I was to hum again. "'I hearin' a horn, thinks I, it's soul the fisherman, he's come again. "'His bellowses is loud enough, as I'm a livin' creator. "'I felt a thing go through my leg. "'Twas nothin' more than a skeeter. "'Then there's the yellow fever, too. "'They call it here El Vomito. "'Come, that won't do, you land crab there.' I tell you, let go my toe. My gracious, it's a scorpion that's took a shine to play with it. I darsn't scare the tarnal thing off for fear he'd run away with it. Afore I come away from hum, I'd had a strong persuasion that Mexicans weren't human beings. An orang o tang nation. A sort of folks a chap could kill and never dream on it arter. No more than a feller dream on pigs that he had to slaughter. I had an idee that they were built arter the darky fashion and all, and kickin' colored folks about, you know, was kinda national. But when I jined, I won't so wise the air queen o' Shelby. For come to look at em, they ain't much different in what we be. And here we air a scroongin' em out o' their own dominions. A shelterin' em, as Caleb says, under our eagle's pinions. Which means to take a feller up just by the slack o' trousers and walk in Spanish clean right out o' all his homes and houses. Well, it does seem a curse way, but then hoorah for Jackson. It must be right, for Caleb says it's regular Anglo-Saxon. The Mexicans don't fight fair, they say. They pisons all the water and do amazing lots of things that isn't what they ought to. Bein' they hain't no lead, they make they bullets out of copper and shoot the darn things at us, too. For which Caleb says ain't proper. 
He says they ought to stand right up and let us pop em fairly. Guess when he catches em at that, he'll have to get up airly. That our nation's bigger than theirs, and so it's right air bigger, and that it's all to make em free, that we air pullin trigger. That anglo saxdom's idee a breakin em to pieces, and that idee's that every man does just what he damn pleases. If I don't make his meanin clear, perhaps in some respects I can. I know that every man don't mean a nigger or a Mexican. And there's another thing I know, and that is, if these creeters that stick an Anglo-Saxon mask on state prison feeders should come to Jalem Center for to argify and spout out on it, the gals would count the silver spoons the minute they cleared out on it. This goin' where glory waits, you hain't one agreeable feeder. And if it warn't for wakin' snakes, I'd be home again short meter. Oh, wouldn't I be off quick time if weren't that I was sartin they'd let the daylight into me to pay for desertin. I don't approve of tellin' tales, but just to you I may state our ossifers ain't what they was afore they left the Bay State. Then it was Mr. Sawin, sir, you're middlin' well now, be ye? Step up and take a nipper, sir. I'm dreadful glad to see ye. But now it's where's my epaulet? Here, Sawin, step and fetch it. And mind your eye, be thunderin' spry, or damn ye, ye shall catch it. Well, as the doctor says, some pork will bile so, but by mighty, if I had some on em to hum, I'd give em lick em vitty. I'd play the rogues march on their hides and other music follerin. But I must close my letter here, for one of em's a hollerin. These Anglo-Saxon ossifers, while well, twain't no use to join, I'm safe enlisted for the war. Yorn, bird of freedom, sawin. Two dusky small boys were quarreling. One was pouring forth a volume of vituperous epithets, while the other leaned against a fence and calmly contemplated him. When the flow of language was exhausted, he said, Are you true? Yes. You ain't got nothing more to say? Well, all them tings what you called me, you is. End of the Yankee Recruit Recording by Alan Putzig, Boston Of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Braymiller. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. My Summer in a Garden by Charles Dudley Warner. Second Week Next to deciding when to start your garden, the most important matter is what to put in it. It is difficult to decide what to order for dinner on a given day. How much more oppressive is it to order in a lump an endless vista of dinners, so to speak? For, unless your garden is a boundless prairie, and mine seems to be that when I hoe it on hot days, you must make a selection from the great variety of vegetables of those you will raise in it, and you feel rather bound to supply your own table from your own garden, and to eat only as you have sown. I hold that no man has a right, whatever his sex, of course, to have a garden to his own selfish uses. He ought not to please himself, but every man to please his neighbor. I tried to have a garden that would give general moral satisfaction. It seemed to me that nobody could object to potatoes, a most useful vegetable, and I began to plant them freely. But there was a chorus of protest against them. You don't want to take up your ground with potatoes, the neighbors said. You can buy potatoes. The very thing I wanted to avoid doing is buying things. What you want is the perishable things that you cannot get fresh in the market. But what kind of perishable things? A horticulturalist of eminence wanted me to sow lines of strawberries and raspberries right over where I had put my potatoes in drills. I had about five hundred strawberry plants in another part of my garden, but this fruit fanatic wanted me to turn my whole patch into vines and runners. I suppose I could raise strawberries enough for all my neighbors, and perhaps I ought to do it. I had a little space prepared for melons, muskmelons, which I showed to an experienced friend. "'You're not going to waste your ground on muskmelons?' he asked. "'They rarely ripen in this climate thoroughly before frost.' He had tried for years without luck. 
I resolved not to go into such a foolish experiment. But the next day another neighbor happened in. Ah, I see you are going to have melons. My family would rather give up anything else in the garden than musk melons of the nutmeg variety. They are the most graceful things we have on the table. So there it was. There was no compromise. It was melons or no melons, and somebody offended in any case. I half resolved to plant them a little late, so that they would, and they wouldn't. But I had the same difficulty about string beans, which I detest, and squash, which I tolerate, and parsnips, and the whole round of green things. I have pretty much come to the conclusion that you have got to put your foot down in gardening. If I had actually taken counsel of my friends, I should not have had a thing growing in the garden today but weeds. And besides, while you are waiting, nature does not wait. Her mind is made up. She knows just what she will raise, and she has an infinite variety of early and late. The most humiliating thing to me about a garden is the lesson it teaches of the inferiority of man. Nature is prompt, decided, inexhaustible. She thrusts up her plants with a vigor and freedom that I admire, and the more worthless the plant, the more rapid and splendid its growth. She is at it early and late and all night, never tiring nor showing the least sign of exhaustion. Eternal gardening is the price of liberty, is a motto that I should put over the gateway of my garden, if I had a gate. And yet it is not wholly true, for there is no liberty in gardening. The man who undertakes a garden is relentlessly pursued. He felicitates himself that, when he gets it once planted, he will have a season of rest and of enjoyment in the sprouting and growing of his seeds. It is a keen anticipation. He has planted a seed that will keep him awake nights, drive rest from his bones, and sleep from his pillow. Hardly is the garden planted when he must begin to hoe it. The weeds have sprung up all over it in a night. They shine and wave in redundant life. The docks have almost gone to seed, and their roots go deeper than conscience. Talk about the London docks. The roots of these are like the sources of the Aryan race. And the weeds are not all. I awake in the morning, and a thriving garden will wake a person up two hours before he ought to be out of bed, and think of the tomato plants, the leaves like fine lacework owing to black bugs that skip around and can't be caught. Somebody ought to get up before the dew is off. Why don't the dew stay on till after a reasonable breakfast, and sprinkle soot on the leaves? I wonder if it is I. Soot is so much blacker than the bugs that they are disgusted and go away. You can't get up too early if you have a garden. You must be early do yourself if you get ahead of the bugs. I think that on the whole it would be best to sit up all night and sleep daytimes. Things appear to go on in the night in the garden uncommonly. It would be less trouble to stay up than it is to get up so early. I have been setting out some new raspberries, two sorts, a silver and a gold color. How fine they will look on the table next year in a cut glass dish, the cream being in a ditto pitcher. I set them four and five feet apart. I set my strawberries pretty well apart also. The reason is to give room for the cows to run through when they break into the garden, as they do sometimes. A cow needs a broader track than a locomotive and she generally makes one. I am sometimes astonished to see how big a space in a flower bed her foot will cover. The raspberries are called Doolittle and Golden Cap. I don't like the name of the first variety, and, if they do much, shall change it to Silver Top. You can never tell what a thing named Doolittle will do. The one in the Senate changed color and got sour. They ripen badly, either mildew or rot on the bush. They are apt to Johnsonize rot on the stem. I shall watch the Doolittles. Fourth Week Orthodoxy is at a low ebb. Only two clergymen accepted my offer to come and help hoe my potatoes for the privilege of using my vegetable total depravity figure about the snake grass, or quack grass, as some call it, and those two did not bring hoes. There seems to be a lack of disposition to hoe among our educated clergy. I am bound to say that these two, however, sat and watched my vigorous combats with the weeds and talked most beautifully about the application of the snake grass figure. As, for instance, when a fault or sin showed on the surface of a man, whether, if you dug down, you would find that it ran back into the original organic bunch of original sin within the man. The only other clergyman who came was from out of town, a half-universalist, who said he wouldn't give twenty cents for my figure. 
He said that the snake grass was not in my garden originally, that it sneaked in under the sod, and that it could be entirely rooted out with industry and patience. I asked the universalist inclined man to take my hoe and try it, but he said he hadn't time, and went away. But jubilate! I have got my garden all hoed the first time. I feel as if I had put down the rebellion. Only there are gorillas left here and there, about the borders and in corners unsubdued, forest docks and quantrel grass, and Beauregard pigweeds. This first hoeing is a gigantic task. It is your first trial of strength with the never-sleeping forces of nature. Several times in its progress I was tempted to do as Adam did, who abandoned his garden on account of the weeds. How much my mind seems to run upon Adam, as if there had been only two really moral gardens, Adam's and mine. The only drawback to my rejoicing over the finishing of the first hoeing is that the garden now wants hoeing a second time. I suppose if my garden were planted in a perfect circle and I started round it with a hoe, I should never see an opportunity to rest. The fact is that gardening is the old fable of perpetual labor, and I, for one, can never forgive Adam Sisyphus, or whoever it was, who led in the roots of discord. I had pictured myself sitting at eve with my family, in the shade of twilight, contemplating a garden hoed. Alas, it is a dream not to be realized in this world. My mind has been turned to the subject of fruit and shade trees in a garden. There are those who say that trees shade the garden too much and interfere with the growth of the vegetables. There may be something in this, but when I go down the potato rows, the rays of the sun glancing upon my shining blade, the sweat pouring from my face, I should be grateful for shade. What is a garden for? The pleasure of man. I should take much more pleasure in a shady garden. Am I to be sacrificed, broiled, roasted for the sake of the increased vigor of a few vegetables? The thing is perfectly absurd. If I were rich, I think I would have my garden covered with an awning, so that it would be comfortable to work in it. It might roll up and be removable, as the great awning of the Roman Colosseum was, not like the Boston one, which went off in a high wind. Another very good way to do, and probably not so expensive as the awning, would be to have four persons of foreign birth carry a sort of canopy over you as you hoed, and there might be a person at each end of the row with some cool and refreshing drink. Agriculture is still in a very barbarous stage. I hope to live yet to see the day when I can do my gardening, as tragedy has done, to slow and soothing music, and attended by some of the comforts I have named. These things come so forcibly into my mind sometimes as I work, that perhaps, when a wandering breeze lifts my straw hat, or a bird lights on a near current bush and shakes out a full-throated summer song, I almost expect to find the cooling drink and the hospitable entertainment at the end of the row. But I never do. There is nothing to be done but to turn round and hoe back to the other end. Speaking of those yellow squash bugs, I think I disheartened them by covering the plants so deep with soot and wood ashes that they could not find them and I am in doubt if I shall ever see the plants again. But I have heard of another defense against the bugs. Put a fine wire screen over each hill, which will keep out the bugs and admit the rain. I should say that these screens would not cost much more than the melons you would be likely to get from the vines, if you bought them. But then, think of the moral satisfaction of watching the bugs hovering over the screen, seeing, but unable to reach the tender plants within. That is worth paying for. I left my own garden yesterday and went over to where Polly was getting the weeds out of one of her flower beds. She was working away at the bed with a little hoe, whether women ought to have the ballot or not, and I have a decided opinion on that point which I should here plainly give did I not fear that it would injure my agricultural influence. I am compelled to say that this was rather helpless hoeing. It was patient, conscientious, even pathetic hoeing, but it was neither effective nor finished. When completed, the bed looked somewhat as if a hen had scratched it. There was that touching unevenness about it. I think no one could look at it and not be affected. To be sure, Polly smoothed it off with a rake and asked me if it wasn't nice, and I said it was. It was not a favorable time for me to explain the difference between puttering hoeing and the broad, free sweep of the instrument which kills the weeds, spares the plants, and loosens the soil without leaving it in holes and hills. 
but after all as life is constituted i think more of polly's honest and anxious care of her plants than of the most finished gardening in the world sixth week somebody has sent me a new sort of hoe with the wish that i should speak favorably of it if i can consistently i willingly do so but with the understanding that i am to be at liberty to speak just as courteously of any other hoe which i may receive if i understand religious morals this is the position of the religious press with regard to bidders and ringing machines in some cases the responsibility of such a recommendation is shifted upon the wife of the editor or clergyman polly says she is entirely willing to make a certificate accompanied with an affidavit with regard to this hoe but her habit of sitting about the garden walk on an inverted flower-pot while i hoe somewhat destroys the practical value of her testimony as to this hoe i do not mind saying that it has changed my view of the desirableness and value of human life it has in fact made life a holiday to me it is made on the principle that man is an upright sensible reasonable being and not a grovelling wretch it does away with the necessity of the hinge in the back the handle is seven and a half feet long there are two narrow blades sharp on both edges which come together at an obtuse angle in front and as you walk along with this hoe before you pushing and pulling with a gentle motion the weeds fall at every thrust and withdrawal and the slaughter is immediate and widespread when i got this hoe i was troubled with sleepless mornings pains in the back kleptomania with regard to new weeders when i went into my garden as i was always sure to see something in this disordered state of mind and body i got this hoe the morning after a day of using it i slept perfectly and late i regained my respect for the eighth commandment after two doses of the hoe in the garden the weeds entirely disappeared trying it a third morning i was obliged to throw it over the fence in order to save from destruction the green things that ought to grow in the garden of course this is figurative language what i mean is that the fascination of using this hoe is such that you are sorely tempted to employ it upon your vegetables after the weeds are laid low and must hastily withdraw it to avoid unpleasant results i make this explanation because i intend to put nothing into these agricultural papers that will not bear the strictest scientific investigation nothing that the youngest child cannot understand and cry for nothing that the oldest and wisest men will not need to study with care i need not add that the care of a garden with this hoe becomes the merest pastime i would not be without one for a single night the only danger is that you may rather make an idol of the hoe and somewhat neglect your garden in explaining it and fooling about with it i almost think that with one of these in the hands of an ordinary day laborer you might see at night where he had been working let us have peas i have been a zealous advocate of the birds i have rejoiced in their multiplication i have endured their concerts at four o'clock in the morning without a murmur let them come i said and eat the worms in order that we later may enjoy the foliage and the fruits of the earth we have a cat a magnificent animal of the sex which votes but not a polecat so large and powerful that if he were in the army he would be called long tom he is a cat of fine disposition the most irreproachable morals i ever saw thrown away in a cat and a splendid hunter he spends his nights not in social dissipation but in gathering in rats mice flying squirrels and also birds when he first brought me a bird i told him that it was wrong and tried to convince him while he was eating it that he was doing wrong for he is a reasonable cat and understands pretty much everything except the binomial theorem and the time down the cycloidal arc but with no effect the killing of birds went on to my great regret and shame the other day i went to my garden to get a mess of peas i had seen the day before that they were just ready to pick how i had lined the ground planted hoed bushed them the bushes were very fine seven feet high and of good wood how i had delighted in the growing the blowing the potting what a touching thought it was that they had all potted for me when i went to pick them i found the pods all split open and the peas gone the dear little birds who are so fond of the strawberries had eaten them all perhaps there were left as many as i planted i did not count them i made a rapid estimate of the cost of the seeds the interest of the ground the price of labor the value of the bushes the anxiety of weeks of watchfulness i looked about me on the face of nature 
the wind blew from the south so soft and treacherous a thrush sang in the woods so deceitfully all nature seemed fair but who was to give me back my peas the fowls of the air have peas but what has man i went into the house i called calvin that is the name of our cat given him on account of his gravity morality and uprightness we never familiarly call him john i petted calvin i lavished upon him an enthusiastic fondness i told him that he had no fault that the one action that i had called a vice was an heroic exhibition of regard for my interest i bade him go and do likewise continually i now saw how much better instinct is than mere unguided reason calvin knew if he had put his opinion into english instead of his native catalogue it would have been you need not teach your grandmother to suck eggs it was only the round of nature the worms eat a noxious something in the ground the birds eat the worms calvin eats the birds we eat no we do not eat calvin there the chain stopped when you ascend the scale of being and come to an animal that is like ourselves inedible you have arrived at a result where you can rest let us respect the cat he completes an edible chain i have little heart to discuss methods of raising peas it occurs to me that i can have an iron pea bush a sort of trellis through which i could discharge electricity at frequent intervals and electrify the birds to death when they alight for they stand upon my beautiful bush in order to pick out the peas an apparatus of this kind with an operator would cost however about as much as the peas a neighbor suggests that i might put up a scarecrow near the vines which would keep the birds away i am doubtful about it the birds are too much accustomed to seeing a person in poor clothes in the garden to care much for that another neighbor suggests that the birds do not open the pods that a sort of blast apt to come after rain splits the pods and the birds then eat the peas it may be so there seems to be complete unity of action between the blast and the birds but good neighbors kind friends i desire that you will not increase by talk a disappointment which you cannot assuage. End of My Summer in a Garden Thirty six of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Matt Butcher, Peoria, Illinois. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Section 36. Crowded. By Uncredited. Chauncey Depew says, In the Berkshire Hills there was a funeral, and as the friends and mourners gathered in the little parlor, there came the typical New England female who mingles curiosity with her sympathy, and, as she glanced around the darkened room, she said to the bereaved widow, Where did you get that new eight-day clock? We ain't got no new eight-day clock, was the reply. You ain't? What's that in the corner there? Why, no, that's not an eight-day clock. That's the deceased. We stood him on end to make room for the mourners. A young wife who lost her husband by death telegraphed the sad tidings to her father in these succinct words. Dear John died this morning at ten. Loss fully covered by insurance. End of section 36. Crowded. This recording by Matt Butcher, Peoria, Illinois. You can visit my blog at mattbutchershop.blogspot.com. For 37 of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Matt Butcher, Peoria, Illinois. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Section 37, The Alarmed Skipper, by James T. Fields. It was an ancient mariner. Many a long, long year ago, Nantucket skippers had a plan of finding out, though lying low, how near New York their schooners ran. They greased the lead before it fell, and then, by sounding through the night, knowing the soil that stuck so well, they always guessed their reckoning right. 
a skipper gray whose eyes were dim could tell by tasting just the spot and so below he doused the glim after of course his something hot snug in his berth at eight o'clock this ancient skipper might be found no matter how his craft would rock he slept for skipper's naps are sound the watch on deck would now and then run down and wake him with the lead he'd up and taste and tell the men how many miles they went ahead one night twas jotham marden's watch a curious wag the peddler's son and so he mused the wanton wretch to-night i'll have a grain of fun we're all a set of stupid fools to think the skipper knows by tasting what ground he's on nantucket schools don't teach such stuff with all their basting and so he took the well-greased lead and rubbed it o'er a box of earth that stood on deck a parsnip bed and then he sought the skipper's berth where are we now sir please to taste the skipper yawned put out his tongue then oped his eyes in wondrous haste and then upon the floor he sprung the skipper stormed and tore his hair thrust on his boots and roared to marden nantucket sunk and here we are right over old marm hackett's garden james t fields end of section thirty seven this recording by matt butcher peoria illinois please visit my blog at mattbutchershop.blogspot.com Eight of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Matt Butcher, Peoria, Illinois. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Section 38. The Wedding Journey by Uncredited he dearest if i had known this tunnel was so long i'd have given you a jolly hug she didn't you why somebody did end of section thirty eight this recording by matt butcher peoria illinois please visit my blog at mattbutchershop.blogspot.com of little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adele de Pinaroles. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Mason. Foreign Correspondence by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Do I think that the particular form of lying often seen in newspapers under the title From Our Foreign Correspondent does any harm? Why, no, I don't know that it does. I suppose it doesn't really deceive people any more than The Arabian Nights or Gulliver's Travels do. Sometimes the writers compile too carelessly, though, and mix up facts out of geographies and stories out of the penny papers so as to mislead those who are desirous of information. I cut a piece out of one of the papers the other day, which contains a number of improbabilities and, I suspect, misstatements. I will send up and get it for you, if you would like to hear it. End of Foreign Correspondent Recording by Dolly Pinaroles Chapter 40 of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adelde Pinaroles. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Our Sumatra Correspondence by Oliver Wendell Holmes. This island is now the property of the Stamford family. Having been won, it is said, in a raffle by Sir Blank Stamford, during the stock gambling mania of the South Sea scheme. The history of this gentleman may be found in an interesting series of questions, unfortunately not yet answered, contained in the notes and queries. This island is entirely surrounded by the ocean, which here contains a large amount of saline substance, 
crystallizing in cubes remarkable for their symmetry, and frequently displays on its surface, during calm weather, the rainbow tints of the celebrated South Sea bubbles. The summers are oppressively hot, and the winters very probably cold, but this fact cannot be ascertained precisely, as, for some peculiar reason, the mercury in these latitudes never shrinks, as in more northern regions, and thus the thermometer is rendered useless in winter. The principal vegetable productions of the island are the pepper tree and the breadfruit tree. Pepper being very abundantly produced, a benevolent society was organized in London during the last century for supplying the natives with vinegar and oysters, as an addition to that delightful condiment. Note received from Dr. D. P. It is said, however, that as the oysters were of the kind called natives in England, the natives of Sumatra, in obedience to a natural instinct, refused to touch them, and confined themselves entirely to the crew of the vessel in which they were brought over. This information was received from one of the oldest inhabitants, a native himself, and exceedingly fond of missionaries. He is said also to be very skilful in the cuisine peculiar to the island. During the season of gathering pepper, the persons employed are subject to various incommodities, the chief of which is the violent and long-continued sternutation, or sneezing. Such is the vehemence of these attacks that the unfortunate subjects of them are often driven backwards for great distances at immense speed, on the well-known principle of the aleopile. Not being able to see where they are going, these poor creatures dash themselves to pieces against the rock, or are precipitated over the cliffs, and thus many valuable lives are lost annually. As during the whole pepper harvest they feed exclusively on this stimulant, they become exceedingly irritable. The smallest injury is resented with ungovernable rage. A young man suffering from the pepper fever, as it is called, cudgelled another most severely for appropriating a superannuated relative of trifling value, and was only pacified by having a present made him of a pig of that peculiar species of swine called the peccavi by the Catholic Jews, who, it is well known, abstain from swine's flesh in imitation of the Mohammedan Buddhists. The bread tree grows abundantly. Its branches are well known to Europe and America under the familiar name of macaroni. The smaller twigs are called vermicelli. They have a decided animal flavor, as may be observed in the soups containing them. Macaroni, being tubular, is the favorite habitat of a very dangerous insect, which is rendered peculiarly ferocious by being boiled. The government of the island, therefore, never allows a stick of it to be exported without being accompanied by a piston, with which its cavity may at any time be thoroughly swept out. These are commonly lost or stolen before the macaroni arrives among us. It, therefore, always contains many of these insects, which, however, generally die of old age in the shops, so that accidents from this course are comparatively rare. The fruit of the bread tree consists principally of hot rolls. The buttered muffin variety is supposed to be a hybrid with the coconut palm, the cream found on the milk of the coconut exuding from the hybrid in the shape of butter, just as the ripe fruit is splitting, so as to fit it for the tea table, where it is commonly served up with cold... There, I don't want to read any more of it. You see that many of these statements are highly improbable. No, I shall not mention the paper, the autocrat of the breakfast table. End of the, Our Symmetric Correspondence Recording by Adele Pinaroles Of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Music Pounding by Oliver Wendell Holmes. The old master was talking about a concert he had been to hear. I don't like your chopped music anyway. That woman, she had more sense in her little finger than forty medical societies, Florence Nightingale, says that the music you pour out is good for sick folks, and the music you pound out isn't. Not that exactly, but something like it. I have been to hear some music pounding. It was a young woman, 
with as many white muslin flounces round her as the planet Saturn has rings, that did it. She gave the music stool a twirl or two, and fluffed down onto it like a whirl of soap suds in a hand basin. Then she pushed up her cuffs, as if she was going to fight for the champion's belt. Then she worked her wrists, and her hands, to limberum, I suppose, and spread out her fingers till they looked as though they would pretty much cover the keyboard, from the growling end to the little squeaky one. Then those two hands of hers made a jump at the keys, as if there were a couple of tigers coming down on a flock of black and white sheep, and the piano gave a great howl, as if its tail had been trod on. Dead stop! So still you could hear your hair growing. Then another jump, and another howl, as if the piano had two tails and you had trod on both of them at once, and then a grand clatter and a scramble and a string of jumps, up and down, back and forward, one hand over the other, like a stampede of rats and mice more than like anything I call music. I like to hear a woman sing, and I like to hear a fiddle sing, but these noises they hammered out of their wooden ivory anvils. Don't talk to me. I know the difference between a bullfrog and a wood thrush. The Poet at the Breakfast Table that is rather a shabby pair of trousers you have on for a man in your position yes sir but clothes do not make the man what if my trousers are shabby and worn they cover a warm heart sir end of music pounding chapter forty two of little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Braymiller. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Living in the Country by Frederick S. Cousins. It is a good thing to live in the country to escape from the prison walls of the metropolis, the great brickery we call the city, and to live amid blossoms and leaves, in shadow and sunshine, in moonlight and starlight, in rain, mist, dew, hoar-frost and drought, out in the open campaign and under the blue dome that is bounded by the horizon only. It is a good thing to have a well with dripping buckets, a porch with honey-buds and sweet-bells, a hive embroidered with nimble bees, a sundial mossed over, ivy up to the eaves, curtains of dimity, a tumbler of fresh flowers in your bedroom, a rooster on the roof, and a dog under the piazza. When Mrs. Sparrowgrass and I moved into the country with our heads full of fresh butter and cool, crisp radishes for tea, with ideas entirely lucid respecting milk, and a looseness of calculation as to the number in family it would take a good laying hen to supply with fresh eggs every morning, when Mrs. Sparrowgrass and I moved into the country, we found some preconceived notions had to be abandoned and some departures made from the plans we had laid down in the little back parlor of avenue g one of the first achievements in the country is early rising with the lark with the sun while the dew is on the grass under the opening eyelids of the morn and so forth early rising what can be done with five or six o'clock in town what may not be done at those hours in the country with the hoe the rake the dibble the spade the watering pot to plant, prune, drill, transplant, graft, train, and sprinkle, Mrs. S. and I agreed to rise early in the country. Richard and Robin were two pretty men. They laid in bed till the clock struck ten. Up jumped Richard and looked at the sky. Oh, brother Robin, the sun's very high. Early rising in the country is not an instinct. It is a sentiment and must be cultivated. A friend recommended me to send to the south side of Long Island for some very prolific potatoes, the real hippopotamus breed. Down went my man, and what with expenses of horse hire, tavern bills, toll gates, and breaking a wagon, the hippopotami cost as much a piece as pineapples. They were fine potatoes, though, with comely features and large, languishing eyes that promised increase of family without delay. As I worked my own garden, for which I hired a landscape gardener at two dollars per day to give me instructions, I concluded that the object of my first experiment in early rising should be the planting of the hippopotamuses. I accordingly arose next morning at five, and it rained. 
I rose next day at five, and it rained. The next, and it rained. It rained for two weeks. We had splendid potatoes every day for dinner. My dear, I said to Mrs. Sparrowgrass, where did you get these fine potatoes? Why, said she, innocently, out of that basket from Long Island. The last of the hippopotamuses were before me, peeled and boiled and mashed and baked with a nice thin brown crust on the top. I was more successful afterward. I did get some fine seed potatoes in the ground, but something was the matter. At the end of the season I did not get as many out as I had put in. Mrs. Sparrowgrass, who is a notable housewife, said to me one day, Now, my dear, we shall soon have plenty of eggs, for I have been buying a lot of young chickens. There they were, each one with as many feathers as a grasshopper, and a chirp not louder. Of course we looked forward with pleasant hopes to the period when the first cackle should announce the milk-white egg, warmly deposited in the hay which we had provided bountifully. They grew finely, and one day I ventured to remark that our hens had remarkably large combs, to which Mrs. S. replied, Yes, indeed. She had observed that. But if I wanted to have a real treat, I ought to get up early in the morning and hear them crow crow said i faintly our hens crowing then by the cock that crowed in the morn to wake the priest all shaven and shorn we might as well give up all hopes of having any eggs said i for as sure as you live mrs s our hens are all roosters and so they were roosters they grew up and fought with the neighbors chickens until there was not a whole pair of eyes on either side of the fence a dog is a good thing to have in the country I have one which I raised from a pup. He is a good stout fellow and a hearty barker and feeder. The man of whom I bought him said he was a thoroughbred, but he begins to have a mongrel look about him. He is a good watchdog, though, for the moment he sees any suspicious-looking person about the premises, he comes right into the kitchen and gets behind the stove. First we kept him in the house, and he scratched all night to get out. Then we turned him out, and he scratched all night to get in. Then we tied him up at the back of the garden, and he howled so that our neighbor shot at him twice before daybreak. Finally we gave him away, and he came back, and now he is just recovering from a fit in which he has torn up the patch that has been sown for our spring radishes. A good strong gate is a necessary article for your garden. A good strong heavy gate with a dislocated hinge, so that it will neither open nor shut. Such a one have I. The grounds before my fence are in common, and all the neighbors' cows pasture there. I remarked to Mrs. S., as we stood at the window in a June sunset, how placid and picturesque the cattle looked as they strolled about, cropping the green herbage. Next morning I found the innocent creatures in my garden. They had not left a green thing in it. The corn and the milk, the beans on the poles, the young cabbages, the tender lettuce, even the thriving shoots on my young fruit trees had vanished, and there they were, looking quietly on the ruin they had made. Our watchdog, too, was foregathering with them. It was too much, so I got a large stick and drove them all out, except a young heifer whom I chased all over the flower beds, breaking down my trellises, my woodbines and sweet briars, my roses and petunias, until I cornered her in the hotbed. I had to call for assistance to extricate her from the sashes, and her owner has sued me for damages. I believe I shall move in town. Mrs. Sparrowgrass and I have concluded to try it once more. We are going to give the country another chance. After all, birds in the spring are lovely. First come little snowbirds, avant couriers of the feathered army, then bluebirds in national uniforms, just graduated, perhaps, from the ornithological corps of cadets with high honors and the topographical class. Then follows a detachment of flying artillery. Swallows, sand martins, sappers, and miners begin their mines and countermines under the sandy parapets. Then cedar birds in trim jackets faced with yellow. Aha! Dragoons! And then the great rank and file of infantry, robins, wrens, sparrows, chipping birds, and lastly, the band. From nature's old cathedral sweetly ring, the wild bird choirs, burst of the woodland band, who mid the blossoms sing, their leafy temple gloomy, tall, and grand, pillared with oaks and roofed with heaven's own hand. There, 
there that is mario hear the magnificent chest note from the chestnuts then a crescendo falling in silence aplomb hush he begins again with a low liquid monotone mounting by degrees and swelling into an infinitude of melody the whole grove dilating as it were with exquisite epithalamium silence now and how still hush the musical monologue begins anew up up into the treetops it mounts fairly lifting the leaves with its passionate effluence it trills through the upper branches and then dipping down the listening foliage in a cadenza of matchless beauty subsides into silence again that's a he catbird says my carpenter a catbird then shakespeare and shelley have wasted powder upon the skylark for never such profuse strains of unpremeditated art issued from living bird before skylark pooh who would rise at dawn to hear the skylark if a catbird were about after breakfast i have bought me a boat a boat is a good thing to have in the country especially if there be any water near there is a fine beach in front of my house when visitors come i usually propose to give them a row i go down and find the boat full of water then i send to the house for a dipper and prepare to bail and what with bailing and swabbing her with a mop and plugging up the cracks in her sides and struggling to get the rudder in its place and unlocking the rusty padlock my strength is so much exhausted that it is almost impossible for me to handle the oars meanwhile the poor guests sit on stones around the beach with woebegone faces my dear said mrs sparrowgrass why don't you sell that boat sell it ha <laughs> ha one day a quaker lady from philadelphia paid us a visit she was uncommonly dignified and walked down to the water in the most stately manner as is customary with friends it was just twilight deepening into darkness when i set about preparing the boat meanwhile our friend seated herself upon something on the beach while i was engaged in bailing the wind shifted and i became sensible of an unpleasant odor afraid that our friend would perceive it too i whispered mrs sparrowgrass to coax her off and get her further up the beach thank thee no susan i feel a smell hereabout and am better where i am mrs s came back and whispered mysteriously that our friend was sitting on a dead dog at which i redoubled the bailing and got her out in deep water as soon as possible dogs have a remarkable scent a dead setter one morning found his way to our beach and i towed him out in the middle of the river but the faithful creature came back in less than an hour that dog's smell was remarkable indeed i have bought me a fike a fike is a good thing to have in the country a fike is a fishnet with long wings on each side in shape like a nightcap with ear lappets in mechanism like a rat trap you put a stake at the tip end of the nightcap a stake at each end of the outspread lappets there are large hoops to keep the nightcap distended sinkers to keep the lower sides of the lappets under water and floats as large as muskmelons to keep the upper sides above the water the stupid fish come downstream and rubbing their noses against the wings follow the curve toward the fike and swim into the trap when they get in they cannot get out that is the philosophy of a fike i bought one of conroy now said i to mrs sparrowgrass we shall have fresh fish tomorrow for breakfast and went out to set it i drove the stakes in the mud spread the fike in the boat tied the end of one wing to the stake and cast the hole into the water the tide carried it out in a straight line i got the loose end fastened to the boat and found it impossible to row back against the tide with the fike i then untied it and it went downstream stake and all i got it into the boat rowed up and set the stake again then i tied one end of the stake and got out of the boat myself in shoal water then the boat got away in deep water and i had to swim for the boat then i rowed back and untied the fike then the fike got away then i jumped out of the boat to save the fike and the boat got away then i had to swim again after the boat and row after the fike and finally was glad to get my net on dry land where i left it for a week in the sun then i hired a man to set it and he did but he said it was rotted nevertheless in it i caught two small flounders and an eel at last a brace of irishmen came down to my beach for a swim at high tide one of them 
a stout athletic fellow after performing sundry aquatic gymnastics dived under and disappeared for a fearful length of time the truth is he had dived into my net after much turmoil in the water he rose to the surface with the filaments hanging over his head and cried out as if he had found a bird's nest i say jimmy begorra here's a foik that unfeeling exclamation to jimmy who was not the owner of the net made me almost wish that it had not been rotted we are worried about our cucumbers mrs s is fond of cucumbers so i planted enough for ten families the more they are picked the faster they grow and if you do not pick them they turn yellow and look ugly our neighbor has plenty too he sent us some one morning by way of a present what to do with them we did not know with so many of our own to give them away was not polite to throw them away was sinful to eat them was impossible said mrs s save them for seed so we did next day our neighbor sent us a dozen more we thanked the messenger grimly and took them in next morning another dozen came it was getting to be a serious matter so i rose betimes the following morning and when my neighbor's cucumbers came i filled his man's basket with some of my own by way of exchange this bit of pleasantry was resented by my neighbor who told his man to throw them to the hogs his man told our girl and our girl told mrs s and in consequence all intimacy between the two families has ceased the ladies do not speak even at church we have another neighbor whose name is bates he keeps cows this year our gate has been fixed but my young peach trees near the fences are accessible from the road and bates cows walk along that road morning and evening the sound of a cow bell is pleasant in the twilight sometimes after dark we hear the mysterious curfew tolling along the road and then with a louder peal it stops before our fence and again tolls itself off in the distance the result is my peach trees are as bare as bean poles one day i saw mr bates walking along and i hailed him bates those are your cows there i believe yes sir nice ones ain't they yes i replied they are nice ones do you see that tree there and i pointed to a thrifty peach with about as many leaves as an exploded skyrocket yes sir well bates that red and white cow of yours yonder ate the top off that tree i saw her do it then i thought i had made bates ashamed of himself and had wounded his feelings perhaps too much i was afraid he would offer me money for the tree which i made up my mind to decline at once sparrowgrass said he it don't hurt a tree a single mossel to chaw it if it's a young tree for my part i'd rather have my young trees chawed than not i think it makes them grow a leetle better i can't do it with mine but you can because you can wait to have good trees and the only way to have a good tree is to have em chawed we have put a dumb waiter in our house a dumb waiter is a good thing to have in the country on account of its convenience if you have company everything can be sent up from the kitchen without any trouble and if the baby gets to be unbearable on account of his teeth you can dismiss the complaint by stuffing him in one of the shelves and letting him down upon the help to provide for contingencies we had all our floors deafened in consequence you cannot hear anything that is going on in the story below and when you are in the upper room of the house there might be a democratic ratification meeting in the cellar and you would not know it therefore if any one should break into the basement it would not disturb us but to please mrs sparrowgrass i put stout iron bars in all the lower windows besides mrs sparrowgrass had bought a rattle when she was in philadelphia such a rattle as watchmen carry there this is to alarm our neighbor who upon the signal is to come to the rescue with his revolver he is a rash man prone to pull trigger first and make inquiries afterward one evening mrs s had retired and i was busy writing when it struck me a glass of ice water would be palatable so i took the candle and a pitcher and went down to the pump our pump is in the kitchen a country pump in the kitchen is more convenient but a well with buckets is certainly more picturesque unfortunately our well water has not been sweet since it was cleaned out first i had to open a bolted door that lets you into the basement hall and then i went to the kitchen door which proved to be locked then i remembered that our girl always carried the key to bed with her and slept with it under her pillow then i retraced my steps bolted the basement door and went up into the dining room as is always the case i found when i could not get any water i was thirstier than i supposed i was then i thought i would wake our girl up then i concluded not to do it 
then i thought of the well but i gave that up on account of its flavor then i opened the closet doors there was no water there and then i thought of the dumb waiter the novelty of the idea made me smile i took out two of the movable shelves stood the pitcher on the bottom of the dumb waiter got in myself with the lamp let myself down until i supposed i was within a foot of the floor below and then let go we came down so suddenly that i was shot out of the apparatus as if it had been a catapult it broke the pitcher extinguished the lamp and landed me in the middle of the kitchen at midnight with no fire and the air not much above the zero point the truth is i had miscalculated the distance of the descent instead of falling one foot i had fallen five my first impulse was to ascend by the way i came down but i found that impracticable then i tried the kitchen door it was locked i tried to force it open it was made of two-inch stuff and held its own then i hoisted a window and there were the rigid iron bars if ever i felt angry at anybody it was at myself for putting up those bars to please mrs sparrowgrass i put them up not to keep people in but to keep people out i laid my cheek against the ice-cold barriers and looked out at the sky not a star was visible it was as black as ink overhead then i thought of baron trenk and the prisoner of killian then i made a noise i shouted until i was hoarse and ruined our preserving kettle with the poker that brought our dogs out in full bark and between us we made the night hideous then i thought i heard a voice and listened it was mrs sparrowgrass calling to me from the top of the staircase i tried to make her hear me but the infernal dogs united with howl and growl and bark so as to drown my voice which is naturally plaintive and tender besides there were two bolted doors and double deafened floors between us how could she recognize my voice even if she did hear it mrs sparrowgrass called once or twice and then got frightened the next thing i heard was a sound as if the roof had fallen in by which i understood that mrs sparrowgrass was springing the rattle that called out our neighbor already wide awake he came to the rescue with a bull terrier a newfoundland pup a lantern and a revolver the moment he saw me at the window he shot at me but fortunately just missed me i threw myself under the kitchen table and ventured to expostulate with him but he would not listen to reason in the excitement i had forgotten his name and that made matters worse it was not until he had roused up everybody around broken in the basement door with an axe gotten into the kitchen with his cursed savage dogs and shooting iron and seized me by the collar that he recognized me and then he wanted me to explain it but what kind of an explanation could i make to him i told him he would have to wait until my mind was composed and then i would let him understand the whole matter fully but he never would have had the particulars from me for i do not approve of neighbors that shoot at you break in your door and treat you in your own house as if you were a jailbird he knows all about it however somebody has told him somebody tells everybody everything in our village the sparrowgrass papers End of living in the country little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by christine g little masterpieces of american wit and humor volume one edited by thomas lansing masson love in a cottage by nathaniel parker willis they may talk of love in a cottage and bowers of trellised vine of a nature bewitchingly simple and milkmaids half divine they may talk of the pleasure of sleeping in the shape of a spreading tree and a walk in the fields at morning by the side of a footstep free but give me a sly flirtation by the light of a chandelier with music to play in the pauses and nobody very near or a seat on a silken sofa with a glass of pure old wine and mamma too blind to discover the small white hand in mine your love in a cottage is hungry your vine is a nest of flies your milkmaid shocks the graces and simplicity talks of pies you lie down to your shady slumber and wake with a bug in your ear and your damsel that walks in the morning is shod like a mountain air true love is at home in a carpet and mightily likes his ease and true love has an eye for a dinner and starves beneath shady trees his wing is the fan of a lady his foot's an invisible thing, and his arrows it tipped with a jewel, and shot from a silver string. 
End of Love in a Cottage Forty four of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. A Case of Conscience, Uncredited. Uncle Jack. It is very good lemonade, I am sure. But tell me, Bonnie, why do you sell yours for three cents a glass when Charlie gets five for his? Miss Bonnie. Well, you mustn't tell anyone, Uncle Jack, but the puppy fell in mine, and I thought it ought to be cheaper. A Hingham, Massachusetts woman, is said to have hit upon a happy idea when she was puzzled what to do in order to tell her mince and apple pies apart. She was advised to mark them, and did so, and complacently announced, This I've marked T.M. Tis mince, and that I've marked T.M. Taint mince. Dr. Oliver Vendel Holmes used to be an amateur photographer. When he presented the picture to a friend, he wrote on the back of it, Taken by O. W. Holmes and Son. End of A Case of Conscience Five of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Hans Breitman's Party by Charles Godfrey Leland. Hans Breitman gave a party. They had piano playing. I fell in love with the American Frau. Her name was Matilda Jane. She had hair as brown as a pretzel. Her eyes was himmel blue. And when they looked into mine, they split mine heart in two. Hans Breitman gave a party. I went there, you'll be proud. I waltzed with Matilda Jan, and went spinning round and round. The puttiest Fraulein in the house. She weighed put two hundred pound, and every dime she give a chomp, she make the window sound. Hans Breitman give a party. I tells you it cost him there. They rolled in morash seven cakes, who fost her at the lager bear. And when fair they knocks, they spick it in. The Deutsches give us a cheer. I dinks that so vine is body, neither come to a head this year. Hans Breiman give a party, they're all was sows and browser. When the super comedy in the company did make themselves to house. They ate us brot and gensy broast, the bratwurst und braten fine, und washed their abendessen down, mit four parrels of neckar wine. Hans Breitman give a party, we all cut trunk ash pigs. I put my mouth to a parrel of beer, and emptied it up mit a schwigs. And then I gave Matilda Jan, and she slogged me on the cup. And the company gifted my devil legs, till the constable made us stop. Hans Breitman gave a party. Where is that party now? Where is the lovely golden cloud that float on the mountain's prow? Where is the Himmelstrahlenstern, the star of the spirit's light? All gone the fair with the lager beer. A fair in the ewig kite. End of Hans Breitman's Party Forty six of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. D. Gavin Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson Tim Crane and the Widow by Francis M. Witcher Oh, no, Mr. Crane, by no matter of mean. Take a minute too soon for you to begin to talk about getting married again. I'm amazed you should be afeard, I think so. See... How long's Miss Crane been dead? Six months, land of Goshen. Why, I've known a number of individuals getting married in less time than that. 
there's phil bennett's widow twas i was talking about just now she twas louisy purse her husband hadn't been dead but three months you know i don't think it looks well for a woman to be in such hurry but for a man it's a different thing circumstances alters cases you know and then situated as you be mr crane it's a terrible thing for your family to be without a head to superintend the domestic concerns and tend to the children to say nothing of yourself mr crane you do need a companion and no mistake six months good grievous why squire titus didn't wait but six weeks arter he buried his first wife afore he married his second i thought there weren't no particular need of his hurrying so seeing his family was all growed up such a critter as he picked out too twas very unsuitable but every man to his taste i uh, hate no disposition to meddle with nobody's concerns there's old farmer dawson too his partner hain't been dead but ten months to be sure he ain't married yet but he would have been long ago if somebody i know on to give him encouragement but tain't for me to speak of that matter he's a clever old critter and as rich as a jew but lawful sakes he's old enough to be my father and there's mr smith jupiter smith you know him mr crane his wife she twas ari putt she died last summer and he's been squinting around among the women ever since and he may squint for all the good it'll do him so far as i'm concerned though mr smith's a respectable man quite young and hain't no family very well off too and quite intellectible but i'm purty particular oh mr crane it's ten year come january since i witnessed the expiration of my beloved companion an uncommon long time to wait to be sure but tain't easy to find anybody to fill the place of old Ezekiel Bennett. I think you're the most like husband of any individual I ever see, Mr. Crane. Six months murderation. Courage, you should be afeard I think was too soon. Why, I'd known. Mr. Crane. Well, Witter, I've been thinking about taking another companion, and I thought I'd ask you. Widow. Oh, Mr. Crane excuse my commotion it's so unexpected just hand me that our bottle of campfire off the mandalory shelf i'm rather faint do put a little mite on my handkercher and hold it to my nose there that'll do i'm obliged to you now i'm rather more composed you may proceed mr crane mr crane well widder i was going to ask you whether whether widow contender mr crane do i know it's terrible embarrassing i remember when my deceased husband made his suppositions to me he stammered and stuttered and was so awfully flustered it did seems as if he'd never get it out in the world and i suppose it's generally the case at least it has been with all of them that's made suppositions to me you see they're generally uncertain about what kind of answer they're going to get and it kind of makes them nervous but when an individual has reason to suppose his attachments reparated i don't see what need there is of his being frustrated though i must say it's quite embarrassing to me pray container mr c well then i want to know if you're willing i should have melissy widow the dragon mr c i hain't said anything to her about it yet thought the proper way was to get your consent first i remember when i courted triffany we were engaged some time before mother Knippy knew anything about it and when she found out she was quite put out because i didn't go to her first so when i made up my mind about melissy thanks me i'd do it right this time and speak to the old woman first widow oh woman hey that's a purty name to call me amazing perlite too what melissy hey tribulation gracious sakes alive why well, i give it up now i always known you was a simpleton tim crane but i must confess i didn't think you was quite so big a fool what melissy do you if that don't be all oh, what an everlasting old calf you must be to suppose she'd look at you why you're old enough to be her father and more too melissy ain't only in her twenty-one year 
What a ridiculous idea for a man of your age, as gray as a rat, too. I wonder what this world is a-coming to. Tis astonishing what fools old witters will make of themselves. Have a Melissy. Melissy. Mr. C. Why, witter, you surprise me. I'd no idea of being treated in this way after you'd been so polite to me and made such a fuss over me and the girls. Widow. Shit your head, Tim Crane. None of your sess to me. There's your hat on that our table, and here's the door, and the sooner you put on one and march out the other, the better it'll be for you. And I advise you, afore you try to get married again, to go out west and see if yet's wife's cold. And arter you're satisfied on that pot, just put a little lamp black on your hair. Twould add to your appearance, undoubtedly, and be of service to you when you want a flourish ran among the gals. And when you got your hair fixed, just splinter the spine of your back. Twouldn't hurt your looks a mite. You'd be entirely unresistible if you was a little grain straighter. Mr. C. Well, I never. Widow. Hold your tongue, you carts aren't all cooped. I tell you, there's your hat and there's the door. Be off with yourself, quick meter, or I'll give you a hist with the broomstick. Mr. C. Jiminy. Widow, rising. Get out, I say. I ain't going to start here and be insulted under my own roof, and so get along. And if you ever darken my door again or say a word to Melissy, it'll be the wasp for you. That's all. Mr. C. Tremendous. What a buster. Widow. Go long, go long, go long, you everlasting old gum. I won't hear another word. Stops her ears. I won't, I won't, I won't. Exit Mr. Crane. Enter Melissa, accompanied by Captain Knut. Good evening, Captain. Well, Melissa, hum at last, hey? Why didn't you stay till morning? Party business keeping me up here so late waiting for you, when I'm any most tired to death ironing and working like a slave all day. Ought to been in bed an hour ago. Thought ye left me with agreeable company, hey? I should like to know what earthly reason you had to suppose old Crane was agreeable to me. I always despised the critter, always thought he was a terrible fool, and now I'm convinced on it. I was completely disgusted with him, and I let him know it tonight. I get him a piece of my mind to I guess he'll be apt to remember for a spell. I rather think he went off with a flea in his ear. Why, Cap'n, did you ever hear of such a piece of audacity in all your born days? For him, Tim Crane, to durst to expect fire to my hand the widow o deacon bet it just as if i'd consent to look at him the old numbskull he don't know b from a broomstick and if he had stayed much longer i'd a teached him the difference i guess he's got his walking ticket now i hope he'll let me alone in the future and where's keir gone home with the cranes hey well i guess it's the last time and now, Missy Bedit, you ain't to have nothing more to do with them gals, do you hear? You ain't to associate with them at all, arter this. Twould only be encouraging the old man to come pestering me again, and I won't have him around, you hear? Don't be in a hurry, Cap'n, and don't be alarmed at my getting impatient about old Crane's presumption. Maybe you think twas unfeeling in me to use him so, and I don't say but what twas ruther, but then he's so awful disagreeable to me, you know. Taint everybody i treat in such a way well you must go good evening give my love to hanner when you write again do call frequently captain canute do the bedit papers end of tim crane and the widow recording by j d gavin of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. The Stammering Wife by John Godfrey Sachs. When deeply in love with Miss Emily Prune, I vowed, if the maiden would only be mine, I would always endeavour to please her. She blushed her consent, though the stuttering lass said never a word except, You're an ass, an ass, an assiduous teaser. 
but when we were married i found to my ruth the stammering lady had spoken the truth for often in obvious dudgeon she'd say if i wanted to give her a dog in the way of reproof you're a dog you're a dog a dog a dogmatic curmudgeon and once when i said we can hardly afford this extravagant style with our moderate hoard and hinted we ought to be wiser she looked i assured you exceedingly blue and fretfully cried you're a jew you're a jew a very judicious adviser again when it happened that wishing it to shirk some rather pleasant and arduous work i begged her to go to a neighbour she wanted to know why i made such a fuss and saucily said you're a cuss 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 you were always accustomed to labour out of temper at last with the insolent dame and feeling that madame was greatly to blame to scold me instead of caressing i mimicked her speech like a churl that i am and angrily said you're a damn 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 a damaged instead of a blessing End of the stammering wife chapter forty eight of little masterpieces of american wit and humour volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by freya hansen little masterpieces of american wit and humour volume one edited by thomas lansing masson he rose to the occasion by uncredited several years ago there laboured in one of the western villages of minnesota a preacher who was always in the habit of selecting his texts from the old testament and particularly some portion of the history of noah no matter what the occasion was he would always find some parallel incident from the history of this great character that would readily serve as a text or illustration at one time he was called upon to unite the daughter of the village mayor and a prominent attorney in the holy bonds of matrimony two little boys knowing his determination to give them a portion of the sacred history touching noah's marriage hit upon the novel idea of pasting together two leaves in the family bible so as to connect without any apparent break the marriage of noah and the description of the ark of the covenant when the noted guests were all assembled and the contracting parties with attendants in their respective stations the preacher began the ceremonies by reading the following text and when noah was one hundred and forty years old he took unto himself a wife then turning the page he continued three hundred cubits in length fifty cubits in width and thirty cubits in depth and within and without besmeared with pitch the story seemed a little strong but he could not doubt the Bible, and after reading it once more, and reflecting a moment, he turned to the startled assemblage with these remarks. My beloved brethren, this is the first time in the history of my life that my attention has been called to this important passage of the Scriptures, but it seems to me that it is one of the most forcible illustrations of that grand eternal truth, that the nature of woman is exceedingly difficult to comprehend. End of He Rose to the Occasion Forty nine of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christine G. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Polite, uncredited. In her abandoning an adopted farm, Miss Kate Sanborn tells of her annoyance at being besieged by agents, reporters, and curiosity seekers. She says, I was so perpetually harassed that I dreaded to see a stranger approach with an air of business. The other day I was just starting out for a drive when I noticed the usual stranger hurrying on. Putting my head out of the carriage, I said in a perpetual and weary tone, "'Do you want to see me?' The young man stopped, smiled, and replied courteously, "'It gives me pleasure to look at you, madam, but I was going farther on.' A small boy in Boston, who had unfortunately learned to swear, was rebuked by his father. "'Who told you that I swore?' asked the bad little boy. "'Oh, a little bird told me,' said the father." The boy stood and looked out of the windows, scowling at some sparrows, which were scolding and chattering. Then he had a happy thought. "'I know who told you,' he said. "'It was one of those sparrows.'" 
End of Polite of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Toner. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Lost, Strayed, or Stolen. It is said that when President Polk visited Boston, he was impressively received at Faneuil Hall Market. The clerk walked in front of him down the length of the market, announcing in loud tones, Make way, gentlemen, for the President of the United States. The President of the United States. Fellow citizens, make room. The chief had stepped into one of the stalls to look at some game, when Mr. Rhodes turned round suddenly, and, finding himself alone, suddenly changed his tone and exclaimed, My gracious, where has that darned idiot got to? End of Lost, Strayed, or Stolen of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. He Came to Pay by Andrew V. Kelly. The editor sat with his head in his hands and his elbows at rest on his knees. He was tired of the ever increasing demands on his time and he panted for ease. The clamor for copy was scorned with a sneer, and he sighed in the lowest of tones, Won't somebody come with a dollar to cheer the heart of Emmanuel Jones? Just then on the stairway a footstep was heard, and a rapid tap loud at the door, and the flickering hope that had been long deferred blazed up like a beacon once more, and there entered a man with a cynical smile that was fringed with a stubble of red, who remarked as he tilted a sorry old tile to the back of an average head, I have come to pay. Here the editor cried, You're as welcome as flowers in spring. Sit down in this easy armchair by my side, and excuse me a while till I bring a lemonade dashed with a little old wine, and a dozen cigars of the best. Ah, here we are. This, I assure you, is fine. Help yourself, most desirable guest. The visitor drank with a relish and smoked, till his face wore a satisfied glow. And the editor, beaming with merriment, joked, in a joyous, spontaneous flow, and then, when the stock of refreshments was gone, his guest took occasion to say, in accents distorted somewhat by a yawn, My errand up here is to pay. But the generous scribe, with a wave of his hand, put a stop to the speech of his guest, and brought in a melon the finest the land ever bore on its generous breast. And the visitor, wearing a singular grin, seized the heaviest half of the fruit, and the juice as it ran in a stream from his chin, washed the mud of the pike from his boot. Then, mopping his face on a favorite sheet, which the scribe had laid carefully by, the visitor lazily rose to his feet, with the dreariest kind of a sigh, and he said, as the editor sought his address, in his books to discover his due, I came here to pay my respects to the press, and to borrow a dollar of you. End of section 51Two of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carl Donovan, Asheville, North Carolina. CarlDonovan.com Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. A Gentle Complaint, Uncredited. To one P.T. Barnum, Esquire, Fairfield, Connecticut. Dear Sir, We have a large, soiled, Asiatic elephant visiting us now, which we suspect belongs to you. 
His skin is a misfit, and he keeps moving his trunk from side to side nervously. If you have missed an elephant answering to this description, please come up and take him away, as we have no use for him. An elephant on a place so small as ours is more of a trouble than a convenience. I have endeavored to frighten him away, but he does not seem at all timid, and my wife and I, assisted by our hired man, tried to push him out of the yard, but our efforts were unavailing. He has made our home his own now for some days, and he has become quite de trop. We do not mind him so much in the daytime, for then he basks mostly on the lawn and plays with the children, to whom he has greatly endeared himself. But at night he comes up and lays his head on our piazza, and his deep and stertorous breathing keeps my wife awake. I feel as though I were entitled to some compensation for his keep. He is a large, though not fastidious, eater, and he has destroyed some of my plants by treading on them. And he also leaned against our woodhouse. My neighbor, who is something of a wag, says I have a lean on his trunk for the amount of his board. But that, of course, is only pleasantry. Your immediate attention will oblige. Simeon Ford End of A Gentle Complaint Recorded by Carl Donovan CarlDonovan.com Fifty-three of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. The Ballad of the Oyster Man, by Oliver Wendell Holmes. It was a tall young oyster man lived by the riverside. His shop was just upon the bank, his boat was on the tide. The daughter of a fisherman, that was so straight and slim, lived over on the other bank, right opposite to him. It was the pensive oyster man that saw a lovely maid, upon a moonlit evening, a sitting in the shade. He saw her wave a handkerchief, as much as if to say, I'm wide awake, young oyster man, and all the folks away. Then up arose the oyster man, and to himself said he, I guess I'll leave the skiff at home, for fear that folks should see. I read it in the story book that, for to kiss his dear, Leander swam the hell's pond, and I will swim this here. And he has leapt into the waves, and crossed the shining stream and he has clambered up the bank, all in the moonlit gleam. Oh, there are kisses sweet as dew, and words as soft as rain, but they have heard her father's step, and in he leaps again. Out spoke the ancient fisherman, Oh, what was that, my daughter? T'was nothing but a pebble, sir, I threw into the water. And what is that, pray tell me, love, that paddles off so fast? It's nothing but a porpoise, sir, that's been a swimming past. Out spoke the ancient fisherman, now bring me my harpoon. I'll get into my fishing boat and fix the fellow soon. Down fell that pretty innocent, as falls a snow-white lamb. Her hair dropped round her pallid cheeks like seaweed on a clam. Alas, for those two loving ones, she waked not from her swoon, and he was taken with the cramp, and in the waves was drowned. But fate has metamorphosed them, in pity of their woe, and now they keep an oyster shop for mermaids down below. End of section 53for a little masterpiece of American wit and humor volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org recording by Joe Sela little masterpieces of American wit and humor volume 1 edited by Thomas Lansing Masson a pleasure exertion written by Marietta Holly well the very next morning Josiah got up with a new idea in his head and he broached it to me to the breakfast table. They have been having sights of pleasure exertions here to Jonesville lately. Every week almost they would go off on an exertion after pleasure, and Josiah was all up on end to go too. That man is a well-principled man as I ever see. But if you had his head, he would be worse than any young man I ever see to follow up picnics and Fourth of Julys and camp meetings and all pleasure exertions. But I don't encourage him in it. I have said to him time and again, There is a time for everything, Josiah Allen, 
and after anybody has lost all their teeth and every mite of hair on top of their head, it is time for him to stop going to pleasure exertions. But good land, I might just as well talk to the wind. If that man should get to be as old as Mr. Methuselah and be going on a thousand years old, he would prick up his ears if he should hear of an exertion. All summer long that man has beset me to go to him, for he wouldn't go without me. Old Bunker Hill himself ain't any sounder in principle than Josiah Allen, and I have had to work head work to make excuses and quell him down. But last week they was going to have one out on the lake, on an island, and that man sought his foot down that go he would. We was to the breakfast table a talking it over, and says I, I shan't go, for I'm afraid of big water anyway. Says Josiah, you are just as liable to be killed in one place as another. Says I, with almost frigid air as I passed him his coffee, maybe I should be drowned on dry land, Josiah Allen, but I don't believe it. Says he, in a complaining tone, I can't get you started onto an exertion for pleasure anyway. Says I, in an almost eloquent way, I don't believe in making such exertions after pleasure. As I have told you time and again, I don't believe in chasing of her up. Let her come of her own free will. You can't catch her by chasing after her no more than you can fetch up a shower and a drop by going outdoors and running after a cloud up in the heavens above you. Sit down and be patient, and when it gets ready, the refreshing rain jostle will begin to fall with none of your help. And it is just so with pleasure, Josiah Allen. You may chase her up over all the oceans and big mountains of the earth, and she will keep ahead of you all the time. But sit down and not fatigue yourself a thinking about her, and like as not, she will come right into your house unbeknown to you. Well, says he, I guess I'll have another griddle cake, Samantha. And as he took it and poured the maple syrup over it, he added gently but firmly, I shall go, Samantha, to this exertion, and I should be glad to have you present at it, because it seems just to me as if I should fall overboard during the day. Men are deep. Now that man knew that no amount of religious preaching can stir me up like that one speech, for though I ain't no hand to coo, and don't encourage him in being spoony at all, he knows that I am wrapped almost completely up in him. I went. Well, the day before the exertion, Kellop Cobb came into our house of Aaron, and I asked him if he was going to the exertion, and he said he would like to go, but he doesn't. Doesn't, says I. Why does it ya? Why, says he. How would the rest of the women round Jonesville feel if I should pick out one woman and wait on her? Says he bitterly. I ain't perfect, but I ain't such a cold-blooded rascal as not to have any regard for women's feelings. I ain't no heart to spile on all the comfort of the day for ten or a dozen women. Why, says I in a dry tone, one woman would be happy, according to your tell. Yes, one woman happy and ten or fifteen galled, bruised in the tenderest place. On their heads, said I inquiringly. No, says he, their hearts. All the girls of probable have more or less hopes than I would invite them. Make a choice of them. But when the blow was struck, when I had passed them by and invited some other, some happier woman, how would them slighted ones feel? How do you suppose they would enjoy the day seeing me with another woman, and they drooping around without me? That is a reason, Josiah Allen's wife, that I doesn't go. It ain't the keeping of my horse through the day that stops me, for I could carry a quart of oats and a little jag of hay in the bottom of the buggy. If I had concluded to pick out a girl and go, I had got it all fixed out of my mind how I would manage. I had thought it over while I was undecided, and duty was a-struggling with me. But I was made to see where the right way for me lay, and I'm going to follow it. Joe Perday is going to have my horse and give me seven shillings for the use of it and its keeping. He come to hire it just before I made up my mind that I had not to go. Of course it is a cross to me, but I am willing to bear crosses for the fair sect. Why, says he, a coming out in an open, generous way, I will be willing, if necessary, for the general good of the fair sect, that I be willing to sacrifice ten cents for him, or pretty nigh that, I wish so well to him. I ain't that enemy to him that they think I am. I can't marry em all, heaven knows I can't, but I wish em well. Well, says I, I guess my dishwater is hot. It must be pretty near bilin' by this time. And he took the hint and started off. I see it wouldn't do no good to argue with him that women didn't worship him. For when a feller once gets it into his head that female women are all after him, you might just as well dispute the wind as argue with him. You can't convince him nor the wind, neither of them. So what's the use of wasting breath on him? And I didn't want to spend an extra day that day anyway, knowing I had such a hard day's work in front of me, of finishing cooking up provisions for the exertion and getting things done up in the house so I could leave them all for the day. We had got to start about middle of the night, for the lake was fifteen miles from Jonesville, and the old mares being so slow, we had got to start an hour or two ahead of the rest. 
I told Josiah in the first aunt that I had just as live set up all night as to be routed out at two o'clock, but he was so animated and happy at the idea of going that he looked on the bright side of everything, and he said that we would go to bed before dark and get as much sleep as we commonly did. So we went to bed the sun an hour high, and I was truly tired enough to lay down, for I had worked dreadful hard that day, almost beyond my strength. But we hadn't more gotten settled down into the bed when we heard a buggy and a single wagon stop at the gate, and I got up and peeked through the window, and I see it was visitors come to spend the evening, Elder Bamber and his family and Deacon Dobbins's folks. Josiah vowed that he wouldn't stir one step out of that bed that night, but I argued with him pretty sharp while I was throwing on my clothes, and I finally got him started up. I ain't deceitful, but I thought if I got my clothes all on before they came in, I wouldn't tell him that I had been to bed that time of day. And I did get all dressed up, even to my handkerchief pen. And I guess they had been there as much as ten minutes before I thought that I hadn't took my nightcap off. They looked dreadful curious at me, and I felt awful meachin'. But I just catched it off and never said nothing. But when Josiah came out of the bedroom with what little hair he has got, standin' out in every direction, no two hairs are layin' the same way, and one of his galluses a hangin', most to the floor under his best coat, I up and told him. I thought maybe they wouldn't stay long, but Deacon Dobbinson's folks seemed to be all waked up on the subject of religion, and they proposed we should turn it into a kind of a conference meeting, so they never went home till after ten o'clock. It was most eleven when Josiah and me got to bed again, and then just as I was getting into a drowse, I heard the cat in the buttery, and I got up to let her out. And that roused Josiah up, and he thought he heard the cattle in the garden, and he got up and went out. And there we was, a marching round most all night. And if we would get into a nap, Josiah would think it was morning, and he would start up and go out to look at the clock. He seemed so afraid that we would be belated and not get to the exertion in time. And there we was on our feet most all night. I lost myself once, for I dreamt that Josiah was a-drowning and Deacon Dobbins was on the shore a praying for him. It started me so I just catched hold of Josiah and hollered. It scared him awfully, and says he, What does ail you, Samantha? I ain't been asleep before tonight, and now you have rousted me up for good. I wonder what time it is. And then he got out of bed again and went and looked at the clock. It was half past one, and he said he didn't believe we had better go to sleep again, for fear we would be too late for the exertion, and he wouldn't miss that for nothing. Exertion, says I, in an awful cold tone. I should think we had had exertion enough for one spell. But as bad and wore out as Josiah felt bodily, he was all animated in his mind about what a good time he was a-going to have. He acted foolish, and I told him so. I wanted to wear my brown and black gingham and a shaker, but Josiah insisted that I should wear a new lawn dress that he had brought me at home as a present, and I had just got made up. So just to please him, I put it on and my best bonnet. And that man, all I could do and say, would put on a pair of pantaloons I had been making for Thomas Jefferson. They was getting up a military company to Jonesville, and these pantaloons was blue, with a red stripe down the sides, a kind of a uniform. Josiah took an awful fancy to him, and says he, I will wear em, Samantha, they look so dressy. Says I, they ain't hardly done. I was going to stitch that red stripe on the left leg on again. They ain't finished as they ought to be, and I would not wear em. It looks vain in you says he, I will wear em, Samantha, I will be dressed up for once. I didn't contend with him. Thinks I, we are making fools of ourselves by going at all, and if he wants to make a little bigger fool of himself by wearing them blue pantaloons, I won't stand in his light. And then I had got some machine oil on to him, so I felt that I had to go wash him, anyway, before Thomas J. took him to wear. So he put him on. I had good vittles and a sight of them. The basket wouldn't hold them all, so Josiah had to put a bottle of red raspberry gel into the pocket of his dress coat, and lots of other little things, such as spoons and knives and forks in his pantaloons and breast pockets. He looked like Captain Kidd armed up to the teeth, and I told him so. But good land, he would have carried a knife in his mouth if I had asked him to. He felt so neat about going, and boasted so on what a splendid exertion it was going to be. We got to the lake about eight o'clock, for the old mare went slow. We was about the first ones there, but they kept a-comin', and before ten o'clock we all got there. The young folks made up their minds they would stay and eat their dinner in a grove on the mainland, but the majority of the old folks thought it was best to go and set our tables where we laid out in the first place. Josiah seemed to be the most rampant of any of the company about going. He said he shouldn't eat a mouthful if he didn't eat it on that island. He said what was the use of going to a pleasure exertion at all if you didn't try and take all the pleasure you could. So about twenty old fools of us sought sail for the island.
I had made up my mind from the first aunt to face trouble, so it didn't put me out so much when Deacon Dobbins, in getting into the boat, stepped onto my new lawn dress and tore a hole in it as big as my two hands, and it ripped half off in the waist. But Josiah, having felt so animated and tickled about the exertion, it worked him up awfully when, just after we had got well out onto the lake, the wind took his hat off and blew it away out onto the lake. He had made up his mind to look so pretty that day that it worked him up awfully, and then the sun beat down onto him and if he had had any hair onto his head it would have seemed more shady. But I did the best I could by him. I stood by him and pinned on his red bandana handkerchief onto his head. But as I was a fixin' it on, I see there was something more than the mortification ailed at him. The lake was rough and the boat rocked, and I see he was beginning to be awful sick. He looked deathly. Pretty soon I felt bad, too. Oh, the wretchedness of that time! I have enjoyed poor health considerable in my life, but never did I enjoy so much sickness in so short a time as I did on that pleasure exertion to that island. I suppose our being up all night almost made it worse. When we reached the island we was both weak as cats. I sought right down on a stun and held my head for a spell, for it did seem as if it was split open. After a while I staggered up onto my feet, and finally I got so I could walk straight and sense things a little though it was tedious work to walk anyway, for we had landed on a sandbar, and the sand was so deep it was all we could do to wade through it, and it was as hot as hot ashes ever was. Then I began to take things out of my dinner basket. The butter had all melted, so we had to dip it out with a spoon, and a lot of water washed over the side of the boat, so my pies and tarts and delicate cakes and cookies look awful mixed up, but no worse than the rest of the companies did. But we did the best we could, and the chicken and cold meats being more solid, had held together quite well, so there was some pieces of it considerable whole, though it was all very wet and soppy. But we separated them out as well as we could, and begun to make preparations to eat. We didn't feel so animated about eating as we should if we hadn't been so sick to our stomachs, but we felt as if we must hurry, for the man that owned the boat said he knew it would rain before night by the way the sun scalded. There wasn't a man or a woman there but what the perspiration and sweat just poured down their faces. We was a haggard and melancholy-looking set. There was a piece of woods a little ways off, but it was up a quite a rise of ground, and there wasn't one of us but what had the rheumatiz more or less. We made up a fire on the sand, though it seemed as if it were hot enough to steep tea and coffee as it was. After we got the fire started, I hissed it an umbrella and sat down under it and fanned myself hard, for I was afraid of a sunstroke. Well, I guess I had sat there ten minutes or more when all of a sudden I thought, Where is Josiah? I hadn't seen him since we got there. I riz up and asked the company, almost wildly, if they'd seen my companion Josiah. They said no, they hadn't. But Celestine Wilkins, the little girl who had come with her grandpa and grandma Gowdy, spoke up and says she, I seen him going off toward the woods. He acted dreadful strange, too. He seemed to be a-walking off sideways. Had the sufferings he had undergone made him delirious? Says I to myself. And then I started off on the run toward the woods and old Miss Bobbitt and Miss Gowdy and Sister Bamber and Deacon Dobbinson's wife all rushed after me. Oh, the agony of them two or three minutes, my mind so distracted with forebodings, and the perspiration and sweat a-pouring down, but all of a sudden, on the edge of the woods, we found him. Miss Gowdy, weighing a little less than me, maybe one hundred pounds or so, had got a little ahead of me. He sought backed up against a tree in an awful cramped position with his left leg under him. He looked dreadful uncomfortable, but when Miss Gowdy hollered out, Oh, here you be. We have been scared about you. What is the matter? He smiled a dreadful sick smile and says he, Oh, I thought I would come out here and meditate a spell. It was always a real treat to me to meditate. Just then I come up a panting for breath, and as the women all turned to face me, Josiah scowled at me and shook his fist at them four women and made the most mysterious motions of his hands towards them. But the minute they turned round, he smiled in a sickish way and pretended to go to whistling. Says I, what is the matter, Josiah Allen? What are you off here for? I'm a meditating, Samantha. Says I, do you come down and join the company this minute, Josiah Allen? You was in a awful taking to come with them, and what will they think to see you act so? The women happened to be looking the other way for a minute, and he looked at me as if he would take my head off, and made the strangest motions toward him. But the minute they looked at him, he would pretend to smile, that deathly smile. Says I, come, Josiah Allen, we're going to get dinner right away for we are afraid it will rain. Oh, wall, says he, a little rain more or less ain't a-going to hinder a man from meditating. I was wore out, and says I, do you stop meditating this minute, Josiah Allen? Says he, I won't stop, Samantha. 
I let you have your way a good deal of the time, but when I take it into my head to meditate, you ain't a going to break it up. Just at that minute they called to me from the shore to come that minute to find some of my dishes, and we had to start off. But, oh, the gloom of my mind that was added to the lameness of my body, them strange motions and looks of Josiah wore on me. Had the sufferings of the night added to the trials of the day made him crazy? I thought more and as likely as not I had got a loony on my hands for the rest of my days. And then, oh, how the sun did scald down onto me, and the wind took the smoke so into my face that there wasn't hardly a dry eye in my head. And then a perfect swarm of yellow wasps lit down onto our vittles as quick as we laid them down, so you couldn't touch a thing without running a chance to be stung. Oh, the agony of that time, the distress of that pleasure exertion. But I kept to work, and when we had got dinner most ready, I went back to call Josiah again. Old Miss Bobbitt said she would go with me, for she thought she'd see a wild turnip in the woods there, and her Shakespeare had an awful cold, and she would try to dig one to give to him. So we started up the hill again. He sawed in the same position, all huddled up with his legs under him, as uncomfortable a looking creature as ever see. But when we both stood in front of him, he pretended to look careless and happy, and smiled that sick smile. Says I, Come, Josiah Allen, dinner is ready. Oh, I hain't hungry, says he. The table will probable full. I had just as leaves wait. Table full, says I, you know just as well as I do that we are eating on the ground. Do you come and eat your dinner this minute? Yes, do come, says Miss Bobbitt. We can't get along without you. Oh, says he, with a ghastly smile, pretending to joke, I have got plenty to eat here. I can eat mosquitoes. The air was black with them. I couldn't deny it. The mosquitoes will eat you, more likely, says I. Look at your face and hands. They're all covered with them. Yes, they have eat considerable of a dinner out of me, but I don't begretch em. I ain't small enough, nor mean enough, I hope, to begretch em one good meal. Miss Bobbitt started off in search for a wild turnip, and after she got out of sight, Josiah whispered to me with a savage look and a tone sharp as an axe, Can't you bring forty or fifty more women up here? You couldn't come here a minute, could you, without a lot of other women tight on your heels? I begun to see daylight, and after Miss Bobbitt had got her wild turnip and so spignet, I made some excuse to send her on ahead, and then Josiah told me all about why he had come off by himself, and why he had been a-sittin' in such a curious position all the time since we had come in sight of him. It seems he had set down on that bottle of raspberry gel. That red stripe on the side wasn't hardly finished, as I said, and I hadn't fastened my thread properly. So when he got to pullin' at him to try to wipe off the gel, the thread started, and being sewed on a machine, that seam just ripped from top to bottom. That was what he had walked off sideways towards the woods for. But Josiah Allen's wife hain't one to desert a companion in distress. I pinned him up as well as I could, and I didn't say a word to hurt his feelings. Only I just said this to him as I was fixin' him. I fastened my gray eye firmly and almost sternly onto him, and says I, Josiah Allen, is this pleasure? Says I, you was determined to come. Throw that in my face again, will you? What if I was? There goes a pin into my leg. I should think I had suffered enough without your stabbing on me with pins. Well, then, stand still and not be a caperin' around so. How do you suppose I can do anything with you a tossin' round so? Well, don't be so aggravatin' then. I fixed em as well as I could, but they looked pretty bad. And there they was all covered with gel, too. What to do I didn't know. But finally I told him I would put my shawl onto him, so I doubled it up cornerways as big as I could, so it almost touched the ground behind, and he walked back to the table with me. I told him it was best to tell the company all about it, but he just put his foot down that he wouldn't, and I told him if he wouldn't that he must make his own excuses to the company about wearing the shawl. So he told him he always loved to wear summer shawls. He thought it made a man look so dressy. But he looked as if he would sink all the time he was saying it. They all looked dreadful curious at him, and he looked as Mishin as if he had stole sheep, and Mishner, and he never took a minute's comfort, nor I another. He was sick all the way back to shore, and so was I. And just as we got into our wagons and started for home, the rain began to pour down. The wind turned our old umbrella inside out in no time. My lawn dress was most spilt before, and now I gave up my bonnet. And I says to Josiah, This bonnet and dress are spilt, Josiah Allen, and I shall have to buy some new ones. Well, well, who said you wouldn't, he snapped out. But it were on him. Oh, how the rain poured down. Josiah, having nothing but a handkerchief on his head, felt it more than I did. I had took a apron to put on getting dinner, and I tried to make him let me pin it on his head, but says he firmly, I ain't proud and haughty, Samantha, but I do feel above riding out with a peak apron on for a hat. 
Well, then, says I, get as wet as sop if you had rather. I didn't say no more, but there we just sought and suffered. The rain poured down, the wind howled at us, the old mare went slow. The rheumatiz laid hold of both of us, and the thought of new bonnet and dress was a wearin' on Josiah, I knew. There wasn't a house for the first seven miles, and after we got there I thought we wouldn't go in, for we had got to get home to milk anyway, and we was both as wet as we could be. After I had beset him about the apron, we didn't hardly say a word for as much as thirteen miles or so. But I did speak once as he leaned forward, with the rain dripping off his bandana handkerchief onto his blue pantaloons. I says to him in stern tones, Is this pleasure, Josiah Allen? He give the old mare an awful cut, and says he, I'd like to know what you want to be so aggravating for. I didn't multiply any more words with him, only as we drove up to our doorstep, and he helped me out into a mud puddle, I says to him, Maybe you hear to me another time, Josiah Allen. And I'll bet he will. I ain't afraid to bet a ten-cent bill that that man won't never open his mouth to me again about a pleasure exertion. End of a Pleasure Exertion A simple-hearted and truly devout country preacher, who had tasted but few of the drinks of the world, took dinner with a high-toned family, where a glass of milk punch was quietly set down by each plate. In silence and happiness, this new vicar of Wakefield quaffed his goblet, and then added, Madame, you should daily thank God for such a good cow. End of section 54. Recording by Joe Sela. Fifty-five of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Sela. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1, edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. The Diamond Wedding, written by Edmund Clarence Stedman. Oh, love, 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 what times were those, long ere the age of bells and bow, and Brussels lace and silken hose, when in the green Arcadian clothes you married Psyche under the rose with only the grass for bedding. Heart to heart and hand to hand you'd followed nature's sweet command, roaming lovingly through the land, nor sighed for a diamond wedding. So have we read in classic Ovid, how Hero watched for her beloved, impassioned youth Leander. She was the fairest of the fair, and wrapped him round with her golden hair. Whenever he landed, cold and bare, with nothing to eat and nothing to wear, and wetter than any gander. For love was love, and better than money, the slyer the theft, the sweeter the honey. And kissing was clover all the world over, wherever Cupid might wander. So thousands of years have come and gone, and still the moon is shining on, still Hymen's torch is lighted, and hitherto in this land of the West most couples in love have thought it best to follow the ancient way of the rest and quietly get united. But now, true love, you're growing old, bought and sold with silver and gold, like a house or a horse and carriage. Midnight talks, moonlight walks, the glance of the eye and the sweetheart sigh, the shadowy haunts with no one by, I do not wish to disparage. But every kiss has a price for its bliss in the modern code of marriage, and the compact suite is not complete till the high contracting parties meet before the altar of Mammon, and the bride must be led to a silver bower, where pearls and rubies fall in a shower, that would frighten Juniper Amon. I need not tell how it befell, St. Jenkins has told the story over and over and over again, in a style I cannot hope to obtain, and covered himself with glory. How it befell one summer's day, the king of the Cubans strolled this way, King January is his name, they say, and fell in love with the Princess May, the reigning belle of Manhattan. Nor how he began to smirk and sue, and dress as lovers who come to woo, or as Max Meredzik and Julian do, when they sit full-bloomed in the lady's view, and flourish the wondrous baton. He wasn't one of your Polish nobles, whose presence or country somehow troubles, and so our cities receive them. Nor one of your make-believe Spanish grandees, who ply our daughters with lies and candies, until the poor girls believe them. No, he was no such charlatan, Count de Hoboken flash in the pan, full of gasconade and bravado, but a regular rich Don Rataplan, Santa Claus de la Mascavado, Senor Grandissimo Bastonado. His was a rental of half Havana and all Matanzas, and Santa Anna, rich as he was, could hardly hold, a candle to light the mines of gold. Our Cuban-owned, chock-full of diggers, and broad plantations at in-round figures, 
were stocked with at least five thousand niggers. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, the Signor swore to carry the day, to capture the beautiful Princess May, with his battery of treasure, velvet and lace she should not lack. Tiffany Hawat, ball and black, Janine and Stuart his suit should back, and come and go at her pleasure. Jet and lava, silver and gold, garnets, emeralds rare to behold, diamonds, sapphires, wealth untold, all were hers to have and to hold, enough to fill a peck measure. He didn't bring all his forces on at once, but like a crafty old Don, who many a heart had fought and won, kept bidding a little higher. And every time he made his bid, and what she said and all they did, t'was written down for the good of the town by Jeems of the Daily Flyer. A coach and horses, you'd think, would buy for the Don an easy victory, but slowly our princess yielded. A diamond necklace caught her eye, but a wreath of pearls first made her sigh. She knew the worth of each maiden glance, and like young colts who curvet and prance, she led the don a deuce of a dance, in spite of the wealth he wielded. She stood such a fire of silks and laces, jewels and gold dressing cases, and ruby brooches and jets and pearls, that every one of her dainty curls brought the price of a hundred common girls. Folks thought the last demented. But at last a wonderful diamond ring, an infant cohenure, did the thing. And sighing with love, or something the same, what's in a name, the Princess May consented. Ring, ring the bells, and bring the people to see the marrying. Let the gaunt and hungry and ragged poor throng round the great cathedral door, to wonder what all the hubbub's for, and sometimes stupidly wonder, at so much sunshine and brightness which fall from the church upon the rich, while the poor get all the thunder. Ring, ring, merry bells ring, O fortunate few with letters blue, Good for a seat and a nearer view, Fortunate few whom I dare not name, Delatante, creme de la creme. We commoners stood by the street façade And caught a glimpse of the cavalcade. We saw the bride in diamond pride, With jeweled maidens to guard her side, Six lustrous maidens in tarlatan. She led the van of the caravan, Close behind her her mother, Dressed in gorgeous moire antique, That told as plainly as words could speak, She was more antique than the other. Leaned on the arm of Dan Rataplan, Santa Claus de la Mascavado, Signor Grandissimo Bastonado, Happy mortal, fortunate man, And Marquis of El Dorado. In they swept all riches and grace, Silks and satins, jewels and lace. In they swept from the dazzled sun, And soon in the church the deed was done. Three prelates stood on the chancel high, a knot that gold and silver can buy, gold and silver may yet untie, unless it is tightly fastened. What's worth doing at all's worth doing well, and the sale of a young Manhattan bell is not to be pushed or hastened. So two very reverends graced the scene, and the tall archbishop stood between, by prayer and fasting chastened. The Pope himself would come from Rome, but Garibaldi kept him at home. Happily these robe prelates thought, their words were the power that tied the knot, but another power that love not tied, and I saw the chain round the neck of the bride, a glistening, priceless, marvellous chain, coiled with diamonds again and again, as befits a diamond wedding. Yet still t'was a chain, and I thought she knew it, and halfway long for the will to undo it, by the secret tears she was shedding. But isn't it odd to think, whenever we all go through that terrible river, whose sluggish tide alone can sever, the archbishop says, the church decree, by floating one into eternity and leaving the other alive as ever, as each wades through the ghastly stream, the satins that rustle and gems that gleam will grow pale and heavy and sink away to the noisome river's bottom clay. Then the costly bride and her maiden six will shiver upon the bank of the Styx, quite as helpless as they were born, naked souls and very forlorn. The princess then must shift for herself and lay her royalty on the shelf. She and the beautiful empress yonder, whose robes are now the wild world's wonder, and even ourselves and our dear little wives, who calico wear each morn of their lives, and the sewing girls and less chauffeurs, in rags and hunger, a gaunt array, and all the grooms of the caravan, I, even the great Don Rataplan, Santa Claus de la Mascavado, Signor Grandissimo Bastanado, that gold-encrusted fortunate man, all will land in naked equality. The lord of a ribbon principality will mourn the loss of his cordon. Nothing to eat and nothing to wear will certainly be the fashion there. Ten to one and I'll go it alone. Those most used to a rag and bone, though here on earth they labor and groan, will stand it best as they wade abreast to the other side of Jordan. End of the Diamond Wedding
When Grant's army crossed the Rappahannock, Lee's veterans felt sure of sending it back as tattered and torn as ever it had been under the new general's numerous predecessors. After the crossing, the first prisoners caught by Mosby were asked many questions by curious Confederates. "'What has become of your pontoon train?' said one such inquirer. "'We haven't got any,' answered the prisoner. "'How do you expect to get over the river when you go back?' "'Oh,' said the Yankee, "'we are not going back. Grant says that all the men he sends back can cross on a log.'" End of section 55 Recording by Joe Sela Of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. What Mr. Robinson Thinks by james russell lowell governor b is a sensible man he stays to his home and looks after his folks he draws his furrow as straight as he can and into nobody's tater patch pokes but john p robinson he says he won't vote for governor b my ain't it terrible what should we do we can't never choose him of course that's flat guess we can have to come round don't you and go in for thunder and guns and all that for john p robinson he says he won't vote for governor b general c is a dreadful smart man he's been on all sides that give places or pelf but consistency still was a part of his plan he's been true to one party and that is himself so john p robinson he says he shall vote for general c general c he goes in for the war he don't rally principle more'n all cud what did god make us rational creatures for but glory and gunpowder plunder and blood so john p robinson he says he shall vote for general c we were getting on nicely up here to our village with good old ideas and what's right and what ain't we kind of thought christ went again more in pillage and the tepulets want the best mark of a saint but john p robinson he says this kind of thing's an exploded idea the side of our country must always be took and president polk you know he is our country and the angel that writes all our sins in a book puts the debit to him and to us the per country and john p robinson he says this is his view of the things to a t parson wilbur he calls all these arguments lies says they're nothing on earth but just fee for and fum and that all this big talk of our destinies is half on its ignorance and t'other half rum but john p robinson he says it ain't no such thing and of course so must we parson wilbur says he never heard such in his life that the apostles rigged out in their swallowtail coats and marched round in front of a drum and a fife to get someone on office and some of them votes but john p robinson he says they didn't know everything down in judee well it's a mercy we've got folks to tell us the rights and the wrongs of these matters i vow god sends country lawyers and other wise fellers to start the world's team when it gets in a slough for john p robinson he says the world'll go right if he hollows out glee old gentleman to driver of street car my friend what do you do with your wages every week put part of it in the savings bank driver no sir after paying the butcher and grocer and rent i pack away what's left in barrels i'm afraid of them savings banks end of section 56pieces of American wit and humor volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit LibriVox.org music by the choir after the church organist had played a voluntary introducing airs from 1492 and the black crook which of course were not recognized by the congregation the choir arose for its first anthem of the morning 
the choir was made up of two parts a quartet and a chorus the former occupied seats in the front row because the members were paid the chorus was grouped about and made a somewhat striking as well as startling picture there were some who could sing some who thought they could and there were others the leader of this aggregation was the tenor of the quartet he was tall, but his neck was responsible for considerable of his extreme height. Because he was paid to lead that choir, he gave the impression to those who saw him that he was cutting some ice. A greater part of his contortions were lost because the audience did not face the choir. The organist struck a few chords, and without any preliminary wood sawing, the choir squared itself for action. Of course, there were a few who did not find the place to laughter rising, this is so in all choirs, but finally all appeared to be ready. The leader let out another link in his neck, and, while his head was taking a motion similar to a hen's when walking, the choir broke loose. This is what it sang. Abide, bide, ab, abide with, abide with, bide, abide me, with me, abide with, with me, as fast falls, abide fast even, as falls thee, abide with me. Even tide was the even tide that the the dark the darkness of I the darkness deepens Lord with me Lord with me deepens Lord Lord darkness deepens with me Lord with me abide That was the first verse. There were three others. Everyone is familiar with the hymn, hence it is not necessary to line the verses. During the performance, some who had not attended the choir rehearsal the Thursday evening previous were a little slow in spots. During the passage of these spots, some would move their lips and not utter a sound, while others, particularly the ladies, found it convenient to feel of their back hair or straighten their hats. Each one who did this had a look as if she could honestly say, I could sing that if I saw fit, and the choir sang on. But when there came a note, a measure, or a bar with which all were familiar, what a grand volume of music burst forth. It didn't happen this way many times, because the paid singers were supposed to do the greater part of the work, and the others were willing. At one point, after a breathing spell, or a rest, as musicians say, the tenor started alone. He didn't mean to, but by this break the deacons discovered that he was in the game and earning his salary. The others caught him at the first quarter, however, and away they went again, neck and neck. Before they finished, several had changed places. Sometimes Abide was ahead, and sometimes Lord, but on the whole it was a pretty even thing. Then the minister, he drew a salary also, read something out of the Bible after which, as they say in the newspapers, there was another well-rendered selection by the choir. This spasm was a tenor solo with chorus accompaniment. This was when he of the long neck got in his deadly work. The audience faced the choir, and the salaried soloist was happy. When the huddling had ceased, the soloist stepped a trifle to the front, and, with the confidence born of a man who stands pat on four aces, gave a majestic sweep of his head toward the organist. He said nothing, but the movement implied, Let her go, Gallagher! Gallagher was on deck, and after getting his patent leather shoes well braced on the sub-bass pedals, he knotted together a few chords, and the soloist was off. His selection was, that is, verbatim, He eyed me, he eyed me, he eyed me, Oh, thou art very the pilgrim throw this power land. And he sang other things. He was a way up in G. He diminuendoed, struck a cantable movement, slid up over a crescendo, tackled a second ending by mistake, but it went, caught his second wind in a moderato, signified his desire for a raise in salary on a trill, did some brilliant work on a maestoso, reached high C with ease, went down into the bass clef and climbed out again, quavered and held, did sixteen notes by the handful, payable on demand, waltzed along a minor passage, gracefully turned the dulceno, skipped a chromatic run, did the con expressione act worthier of a derezki, poured forth volumes on a measure bold, broke the center of an andante passage for three yards, retarded to beat the band, came near getting applause on a cadenza, took a six-barred triplet without turning a hair, then sat down. Between whiles, the chorus had been singing something else. The notes bumped against the oiled natural wood rafters. It was a modern church. Ricocheted over the memorial windows, clung lovingly to the two $200 chandelier, 
floated along the ridge pole, patted the bald-headed deacons fondly, and finally died away in a bunch of contribution boxes in the corner. Then the minister preached. A Chicago man who had recently returned from Europe was asked by a friend what he thought of Rome. Well, he replied, Rome is a fair-sized town, but I couldn't help but think when I was there that she had seen her best days. End of chapter four, Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1《A Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adele de Pignoroles. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. The Notorious Jumping Frog of Calaveras County by Mark Twain. In compliance with the request of a friend of mine, who wrote me from the East, I called on good-natured, garrulous old Simon Wheeler, and inquired after my friend's friend, Lenaudius W. Smiley, as requested to do, and I hereunto append the result. I have a lurking suspicion that Leonidas W. Smiley is a myth, that my friend never knew such a personage, and that he only conjectured that if I asked old Wheeler about him, it would remind him of his infamous Jim Smiley, and he would go to work and bore me to death, with some exasperating reminiscence of him as long and tedious as it should be useless to me. If that was the design, it succeeded. I found Simon Wheeler dozing comfortably by the barroom stove of the dilapidated tavern in the decaying mining camp of Angels, and I noticed that he was fat and bald-headed, and had an expression of winning gentleness and simplicity upon his tranquil countenance. He roused up and gave me good day. I told him a friend of mine had commissioned me to make some inquiries about a cherished companion of his boyhood named Leonidas W. Smiley, Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, a young minister of the gospel, who he had heard was at one time a resident of Angel's Camp. I added that if Mr. Wheeler could tell me anything about this Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, I would feel under many obligations to him. Simon Wheeler backed me into a corner and blockaded me there with his chair, and then sat down and reeled off the most monotonous narrative which follows this paragraph. He never smiled. He never frowned. He never changed his voice from the gently flowing key to which he tuned his initial sentence. He never betrayed the slightest suspicion of enthusiasm. But all through the interminable narrative, there ran a vein of impressive earnestness and sincerity, which showed me plainly that, so far from his imagining that there was anything ridiculous or funny about his story, he regarded it as a really important matter, and admired its two heroes as men of transcendent genius in finesse. I let him go on his way, and never interrupted him once. Reverend Leonidas W. Hmm, Reverend Le... Well, there was a fellow here once by the name of Jim Smiley, in the winter of 49, or maybe it was the spring of 50. I don't recollect exactly. Somehow though it makes me think it was one of the others, because I remember the big flume weren't finished when he first come to the camp. But anyway, he was the curiousest man was about always betting on anything that turned up you ever see, if he could get anybody to bet on the other side, and if he couldn't, he changed sides. Any way that suited the other man would suit him. Anyway, just so as he got a bet, he was satisfied. But still he was lucky, uncommon lucky. He must always come out winner. He was always ready and laying for a chance. There couldn't be no solitary thing mentioned but that feller'd offer to bet on it, and take every side you pleased, as I was just telling you. If there was a horse race, you'd find him flush or you'd find him busted at the end of it. If there was a dog fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a cat fight, he'd bet on it. If there was a chicken fight, he'd bet on it. Why, if there was two birds sitting on a fence, he would bet you which one would fly first, or if there was a camp meeting, he would be there regular to bet on Parson Walker, which he judged to be the best exhorter about here. And so he was, too, and a good man. If he even see a straddle bug start to go anywhere, he would bet how long it would take him to get to, to wherever he was going to. And if you took him up, he would follow that straddle bug to Mexico, but it, he would find out where he was bound for and how long he was on the road. Lots of the boys here has seen that smiling and can tell you about him. Why, it never made no difference to him. He'd bet on anything. 
Parson Walker's wife lay very sick once for a good while, and it seemed as if they weren't going to save her. But one morning he come in, and Smiley up and asked him how she was, and he said she was considerable better. Thank the Lord for his infinite mercy. And coming on so smart that with the blessing of Providence she'd get well yet. And Smiley, before he thought, says, Well, I'll risk two and a half she don't anyway. This year Smiley had a mare. The boys called her the fifteen-minute nag, but that was only in fun, you know, because of course she was faster than that, and he used to win money on that horse. For all she was slow and always had the asthma, or the distemper, or the consumption, or something of that kind. They used to give her two or three hundred yards start, and then pass her under way. But always at the fag end of the race, she'd get excited and desperate-like, and come cavorting and straddling up, and scattering her legs around limber sometimes in the air, and sometimes out to one side among the fences, and kicking up more dust, and raising more racket with her coughing and sneezing and blowing her nose, and always fetch up at the stand just about a neck ahead, as near as you could cipher it down. And he had a little small bull pup, that to look at him you would think he weren't a scent, but to head around and look ornery and lay for a chance to steal something. But as soon as money was up on him, he was a different dog. His underjaw began to stick out like the forecastle of a steamboat. And his teeth would uncover and shine like the furnaces. And a dog might tackle him and bully-rag him and bite him and throw him over his shoulder two or three times. And Andrew Jackson, which was the name of the pup, Andrew Jackson would never let on, but he was satisfied and hadn't expected nothing else. And the bets being doubled and doubled on the other side all the time till the money was all up and then all of a sudden he would grab that other dog just by the joint of his hind leg and freeze to it. Not chaw, you understand, but only just grip and hang on till they throw it up the sponge, if it was a year. Smiley always come out winter on that pup, till he harnessed a dog once that didn't have no hind legs, because they'd been sawed off in a circular saw, and when the thing had gone along far enough, and money was all up, and he come to make a snatch for his pet holt, he see in a minute how he'd been imposed on, and how the other dog had him in the door, so to speak and he appeared surprised, and then he looked sort of discouraged like, and didn't try no more to win the fight, and so he got shucked out bad. He gave Smiley a look, as much as to say his heart was broke, and it was his fault, and for putting up a dog that hadn't no hind legs for him to take a hold of, which was his main dependence in a fight, and then he limped off a piece and lay down and died. It was a good fuck, but was that Andrew Jackson, and would have made a name for himself if he'd lived, for the stuff was in him and he had genius. I know it, because he hadn't no opportunity to speak of, and it don't stand a reason that a dog can make such a fight as he could under the circumstances, if he hadn't no talent. It always makes me feel sorry when I think of that last fight of his and the way it turned out. Well, this year Smiley had rat terriers, and chicken cocks, and tomcats, and all of them kind of things you till you couldn't rest, and you couldn't fetch nothing for him to bet on but he'd match you. He catched a frog one day, and took him home, and said he'd calculated to educate him. And so he never did nothing for three months, but sat in his backyard and learned that frog to jump. And you bet he did learn him, too. He'd give him a little punch behind, and the next minute you'd see that frog whirling in the air like a doughnut. See him turn one somerset, or maybe a couple, if he got a good start, and come down flat-footed and all right, like a cat. He got him up so in the matter of catching flies and kept him in practice so constant that he'd nail a fly every time as far as he could see him. Smiley said all a frog wanted was education, and that he could do most anything, and I believe him. Why, I've seen him set Daniel Webster down here on this floor, Daniel Webster was the name of the frog, and sing out, Flies, Daniel, flies! And quicker than you could wink, he'd spring up and snake a fly off on the counter there, and the flop down on the floor again as solid as a gob of mud, and fall to scratch inside of his head with his hind foot, as indifferent as if he hadn't had no idea he'd been doing any more than any frog might do. You never see a frog so modest and straight ordered as he was, for all he was so gifted, and when it come to fair and square jumping on a dead level, he could get over more ground at one straddle than any animal of his breed you ever see. Jumping on a dead level was a strong suit, you understand, and when it come to that, Smiley would ain't up money on him as long as he had a red. Smiley was monstrous proud of his frog, and well might he be, for fellers that had traveled and been everywhere said he laid over any frog that ever they see. Well, Smiley kept the beast in a little lattice box, and he used to fetch him downtown sometimes and lay for a bet. One day a feller, a stranger in the camp he was, 
come across him with his box and says, "'What might it be that you've got in the box?' And Smiley says, sort of indifferent like, "'It might be a parrot, or it might be a canary, maybe, but it ain't. It's only just a frog.' And the feller took it and looked at it careful and turned it around this way and that and says, Hmm, so tis. Well, what's he good for? Well, Smiley says, easy and careless, he's good enough for one thing, I should judge. He can outjump any frog in Calaveras County. The feller took the box again and took a long particular look and gave it back to Smiley and says, very deliberate, Well, he says, I don't see no points about that frog that's any better than any other frog. Maybe you don't, Smiley says. Maybe you understand frogs, and maybe you don't understand them. Maybe you've had experience, and maybe you ain't only amateur, as it were. Anyways, I've got my opinion, and I'll risk forty dollars that he can outjump any frog in Calaveras County. And the feller studied a minute, and then says, kinder sad like, Well, I'm only a stranger here, and I ain't got no frog, but if I had a frog, I'd bet you. And then Smiley says, That's all right. That's all right. If you'll hold my box a minute, I'll go and get you a frog. And so the feller took the box and put up his forty dollars along with Smiley's and sat down to wait. So he sat there a good while thinking and thinking to himself, and then he got the frog out and prized his mouth open and took a teaspoon and filled him full of quail shot, filled him pretty near up to his chin, and set him on the floor. Smiley, he went to the swamp and slopped around in the mud for a long time, and finally he catched a frog and fetched him in, and gave him to this feller, and says, Now, if you're ready, set him alongside of Daniel, with his four paws just even with Daniel's, and I'll give the word. Then he says, One, two, three, get! And him and the feller touched up the frogs from behind, and the new frog hopped off lively. But Daniel would give a heave, and hissed it up the shoulders, so, like a Frenchman, but it warn't no use, he couldn't budge. He was planted as solid as a church, and he couldn't no more stir than if he was anchored out. Smiley was a good deal surprised, and he was disgusted too, but he didn't have no idea what the matter was, of course. The feller took the money and started away, and when he was going out at the door, he sort of jerked his thumb over his shoulder, so, at Daniel, and says again, very deliberate, Well, he says, I don't see no points about that frog that's any better than any other frog. Smiley, he stood scratching his head and looking down at Daniel for a long time, and at last he says, I do wonder what in the nation that frog threw it off for. I wonder if there ain't something the matter with him. He appears to look mighty baggy somehow. And he catched Dan'l up by the nap of the neck and hefted him and says, Why, blame my cats if you don't weigh five pound. And turned him upside down and he belched out a double handful of shot. And then he see how it was and he was the maddest man. He set the frog down and took out after that feller, but he never catched him. And... Here Simon Wheeler heard his name called from the front yard, and got up to see what was wanted, and turning to me as he moved away, he said, Just set where you are, stranger, and rest easy. I ain't going to be gone a second. But by your leave, I did not think that a continuation of the history of the enterprising vagabond Jim Smiley would be likely to afford me much information concerning the Reverend Leonidas W. Smiley, and so I started away. At the door, I met the sociable Wheeler returning, and he buttonholed me and recommenced. Well, this year Smiley had a yaller, one-eyed cow that didn't have no tail, only just a short slump like a banananer, and, however, lacking both time and inclination, I did not wait to hear about the afflicted cow, but took my leave. End of the Notorious Jumping Frog of Calaveras County Recording by Adelde P. Neurolic. End of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 1. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson.